this morning in our first session, the committee uh, is holding a meeting with Mr. Fred Barry in advance of his appointment as chairperson of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board and ask that he would provide us with his strategic vision for his role. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome you, Mr. Barry, to the committee and thank you for your attendance. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, now, uh, Mr Barry, if you Indeed. would uh, provide us with your opening statement, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairman and Committee Members, for inviting me to speak to you today. And I'm here in my capacity as Chair-designate of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board. The Development Board has the remit to design, build and equip a new National Children's Hospital on the campus shared with St James's Hospital and the two paediatric outpatient and urgent care centres on the Connolly and the Talley University Hospital campuses. Considerable progress has been made in this remit to date. The Connolly facility will open later this year and construction of both the main hospital at St James's and of the Talla facility has commenced. And I'd like to acknowledge the contribution and personal commitment of my predecessor, Mr Tom Costello, in chairing the Development Board to this point. My own background is, I believe, relevant to the proposed role. I'm a chartered engineer with additional qualifications in management, law, arbitration and mediation. I've worked internationally on the design and construction of many very large capital projects and was Group Managing Director for the UK and Ireland with Jacobs, which is one of the world's biggest engineering companies. I worked in the public sector as Chief Executive of the National Roads Authority at a time when we built much of the motorway network and I have extensive board experience in both the private and public sectors. The New Children's Hospital is not just another big infrastructure project, it's more than that. It will be transformational for the care we give our children and young people and they represent about a quarter of our population. I'm honoured to be asked to play a role in its development and finally I look forward to working with the Board of the Children's Health Ireland on this great national project. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have, Chairman. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Barry. We're now going to open the yes. proceedings to, to our members. So our first uh, member is Deputy Stephen Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mr. Barry, thank you for uh, contacting the committee and for, um, for coming in to, uh, to, to the committee this morning. I want to wish you the very best of luck. You've, uh, you've, you've picked up a baton halfway through the race, and uh, it's a, a fraught race indeed. So I, uh, I, I wish you and your team the very best. Um, can I ask you... As I'm sure you're aware, there is serious public concern and widespread anger at uh, the cost overruns from an initial declaration in 2016 of 650 million up to a final cabinet sign off in 2017 of 980 million, so 50% up. Uh, from 980 million then the following year up to 1.4 billion, so an additional 50% on top of that. And there's an additional 300 million on top of that for commissioning and IT and so forth, bringing us up to 1.7 billion euro. Um, can I ask what your position is? I appreciate you're still chair designate, and this is going to take time, but you, you, you are someone with very significant experience in large ca capital programs. What's your view as the incoming chair as to the cost of 1.7 billion euro? Do you, do you believe it is a, an unavoidable and high cost for a complex project? Um, or do you believe that the costs have spiralled 
uh, and that it no longer represents a reasonable cost for that building. Um, and if so, do you believe there are, at this stage, material opportunities to bring the cost back down, uh, for example, through an extensive value engineering uh, exercise? Um, or indeed, you, you, you may think none of those things. Can I ask you, uh, coming in, what, what's your sense of where we're at? The current cost, is it reasonable? And can it be brought back down? Certainly, and I would just sort of caution everybody on my comments because I have very limited knowledge. I mean, I'm only I'm only yeah. just into it. Okay, on the on the cost on the 1.7 billion, I'm not sure. I would be more familiar with what's involved in the 1.4 something billion for the build than I am for the the other 300 million of costs which are being incurred by the hospital operating entity and I'm just not familiar with their cost structures and so on. On the 1.4 billion, as, as far as I can judge, and much of this is out in the public domain already, but as far as I can judge, what happened here was an underestimation of the scope of the project at a very early stage compounded by tender documents for the initial tender documents for the construction which didn't properly pick up the full scope which led to prices coming in that didn't represent you know what the cost would be now you you would like in any circumstance to have had more of the total cost determined through competitive tendering rather than partially competitive tendering and partially subsequent negotiation so you could argue the toss as to whether the price or not is exactly what it would have been if it had gone through competitive tender. But I don't think it would be significantly different from where it has ended. I did, I did find when I was reviewing the situation with my future colleagues inside that uh, there was an independent expert who signed off on a lot of the additional costs and adjudicated on them you know, as being fair and reasonable for the work that was involved. So I really think what we're looking at here is a late recognition of the scope of the work and what it's going to cost, rather than spending far too much on achieving the result that is to be obtained. On the question of reducing costs, I know that there was a very big value engineering exercise carried out at the time of the original tender. It's a, an ambitious target of 70 million, I think it is, was, was set to save at that time. They succeeded in getting about 20 million or so. I know that there has been value engineering carried out over the last few months, looking at further measures, and I know there are some efforts being made at the moment. But the savings coming from anything going on at the moment were into diminishing returns. You know, and there are no savings to be had there that will significantly affect the headline figure. The challenge over the next few years is going to be to contain any uh, growth in that. Because I think, again, you'll be aware from previous evidence that uh, there's a guaranteed max price with the contractor for the main construction elements, but there are exclusions to that. There's inflation which is outside of our control completely, that will be what it will be. But if there are scope changes as uh, medical technology evolves over the next few years, there may be issues to be dealt with there. Regulatory changes will, may affect things. But really, our challenges over the next few years are all around getting the hospital built. You know, it's a five-year program to build and commission this. There will be thousands of people working in what is a very constrained site. And the challenges for me and the board and the executive will be getting it built safely. We don't want accidents on the site. That's going to be a key thing. Uh, there will be ensuring that we get the design quality and the build quality that we're entitled to get for the money that's getting spent. There will be mitigating the impact of very large scale, scale construction on hospital operations and on the neighbourhood, because we are building in a, a very busy neighbourhood. We've got to procure a lot of equipment and deliver it to the hospital. You know, there'll be integration between ourselves and CHI. So there, the, and there'll be all the unexpected events that occur over a five-year construction program. Thank you. So these are the areas where really I think my focus and the board's focus will be over the coming years. Thanks. Um, in terms of eliminating or minimising further error, can I ask? Do you foresee any personnel changes within the management structure? One of the things that has struck me uh, 
over the recent two months is that in spite of the cost overruns, uh, not a single person was fired, um, not a single person had any uh, uh, HR sanctions taken against them of any kind. We were told that not a single contract was changed, not a single company was asked to step down in spite of these massive cost, unprecedented cost overruns. Um, two questions. Do you foresee, I'm not asking for specifics, but do you foresee coming in that actually personnel changes are required? Do you foresee that some of the companies involved uh, m may need to be asked to step back? Um, and, and on the same vein, just in your own ex considerable experience, one of the things that really jumped out at me as the costs went up, one of the line items was the design team fees. Now we've heard that um, there were very significant underestimations. I, I have a different view as to what happened, but that's the government position is that you know the costs were massively underestimated. We heard from people here at committee that quantities were massively underestimated and so forth. And my understanding is that some of the people who do that are within this design team. There are seven companies in the design team, including QS and architects and, and Mechanelec engineers and so forth. And in spite of this massive underestimation and what appear to be huge errors, the design team, not only were none of them fired, but actually it was agreed that their fees would jump in one year from 44 million to 71 million. So not only were they not fired or penalised, they actually nearly had their fees doubled. Um, so given all of that, do you have a view on the design team? Do you have a view, view on any of the other contractors involved? And do you, have a, do you have a view on any of the personnel at a management level where changes may need to be made? What? I think it would be a bit premature of me to make comments on any of the questions you've asked there. Uh, for two reasons. One is because I'm still designate and it would be completely improper for me to form particular views on the companies or people when I'm not even in the role yet. And the second thing is, of course, we have the PwC report coming up in what I think will be a matter of weeks and I'm certainly looking forward to see what's in that myself and I'm sure everybody else is as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Barry. I'm going to move on if that's okay. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Um, Senator Burke. Yeah, just very briefly, um, <clears throat> last week I had the privilege of having a conference call with um, three people from Ontario and Canada who were involved in a new uh, development out in Canada. And one of the issues is a new children's hospital, showing them native beds, um, but they have to do a lot of work beforehand. They have to build a 22-storey office block to decant all of the admin staff into this 22-storey office block and then demolish all of the existing offices and then start building a children's hospital. <clears throat> but one of the issues that came up uh, during the conversation was the inflation <clears throat> there on building costs in, in Toronto and Canada. And over 15 months, inflation has gone up, building inflation has gone up by 15%. It's about 1% per month. Uh, and it's in that context that I'm asking the question about, um, you know, the contract that we currently have in relation to Children's Hospital and the built-in mechanism in relation to inflation, because this project is not going to be finished until 2022-2023. Uh, uh, we have a price that we're talking about now. Uh, there is built-in issues in relation to inflation. And I'm just wondering, from that point of view, um, having looked at it, and I know now you've had only a preliminary look at it, what is the likelihood of uh, inflation adding to the cost and you know can we control that issue because uh, and you might maybe give us an overall view of what your own view on the building inflation issue is going to be here over the next three to four years because that is a factor in relation to any major building project like this so you might maybe outline your own views on that certainly chairman uh, uh, Sen senator burke the the contract has an inflation rate of 4% covered within it. So inflation in excess of 4% will lead to additional payments and additional costs. As to the likelihood of that, uh, a continuous rate of inflation in excess of 4% would be, you know, going on for years, you know, for perhaps another four or five years, 
would be unusual. Right. If that does happen, it's because the economy is continuing to boom. Uh, but the inflation rates are quite high at the moment, and in particular for a lot of the skilled trades that will be needed on the hospital, they are the same trades that are needed on some of the big industrial developments. There are some very big life science developments going on in the country at the moment. I think many of you will have seen that Intel have a huge program of work started and another one to follow hot on its heels if they get permission. So there are a lot of cost pressures there. And certainly the inflation rate in construction at the moment is running in excess of the 4%. It's depending on whose measure you take, it's probably about 6% plus. Uh, I would be surprised to see it continue at 6% for another four or five years, only because that would imply a very superheated economy during that period. But I don't know. But just, I'm just wondering, could you translate that in relation to, you were saying the contract allows for 4%? Yes. But is it 4% per annum or 4% over the four years? 4% per annum. Right. And so, it, so if, say, between the middle of this year and the middle of next year, inflation were 5% instead of 4%, then there would be an extra 1% payable on the monies uh, dispersed which are, which during, during that period. And if it's a 6%, and obviously, 6% is then 2%, 2%, and so on, yes. Okay, so over four years, you believe that there would be some inflation, but you're not... You're not convinced that it will be more than 4%? Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm sure economists are always very keen on giving forecasts on inflation and things. They're no more accurate than the rest of us. I, mean, I, I don't know. But I do know that for inflation to stay at a very high level in construction for that length of time, it would require continuing very strong pressures in the marketplace. Now, if they happen, it's because the country is doing exceptionally well. But I really can't tell you what's, what it's going to be. And just the other issue that I just want to raise, um, and it's an issue I suppose really because uh, this is one of the biggest projects in relation to the healthcare sector that we are engaging in. And it's, I think, nearly 20 years ago since we built a major medical facility. Okay, we've done extensions to yes. medical facilities. Uh, and, you know, I'm just wondering um, do you envisage looking at projects outside of Ireland as regards how they controlled? The kind of cost, for instance, I looked at the Manchester Children's Hospital, which cost, um, I think it was a 370 bed unit, cost 504 million in 2004, took five years to build. I'm just wondering, uh, do you plan on looking at other projects and seeing how we can best make sure, make sure that we don't already there's mistakes made in this one, but that there's further uh, mistakes that we can avoid by looking at other projects? Well, I, I would say, uh, Chairman and Senator Burke, that for my role on the development board, the management of a large project like this, uh, once the user requirements are in place and you know the design is done, in managing the actual construction <coughs> side of it, the the control methodologies you would use wouldn't vary too much here to doing any of the large advanced manufacturing facilities around the country. So I'll really be looking to what has worked on other very large projects in Ireland. Okay. But I, I mean, I've worked on large projects in other places. I'm not immune or not averse to taking lessons learned from anywhere. Okay. But I, yeah. And finally, do you, do you actually see, is there any issue uh, in relation to the site itself um, that you're concerned about that may cause delays, which in turn then cause, uh, will call... Um, additional cost? Uh, well, well there, is, there is no doubt that <clears throat> any city site is more difficult to work in than, you know, a greenfield site. And that's certainly true in James's Street, where the footprint of the hospital building occupies most of the land that's available. You know, so okay. there are no big lay-down spaces available around the, around the construction. There are no significant spaces available for stacking of equipment and supplies coming in. Right. So that is a very definite constraint, which uh, it concerns me as much on the safety side, I must say, as on the efficiency side. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Senator Burke. Thank you. Uh, Deputy O'Brien, do you mind if we allow... I'm quite happy to leave Deputy yep. Kelly, because I know he's rushing to the pack launch. Sure. I'm you're not good. going to it. So you're, you're going to be coming with me. I'm not going to it. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy O'Brien. Deputy Kelly. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. I just I thought we were doing the normal spokespeople first. Um, I have a packed launch there in a few minutes. Uh, a couple of questions, and then I'll have to run. Um, I'll put them all out, and then you might answer them. It'll be easier just after that. 
Um, well, firstly, I know you're chair designate that has restrictions. It was probably beneficial for you coming in here today. <laughs> but um, what did you make of the offer by the main contractor, BAM, to opt out of the contract at the time in which they did? What, what was your opinion on that? Um, second question, do you believe, having looked at your board, that you have the expertise required there? I'm not asking for any individual commentary. I'm just talking in general because I don't think individual commentary would be appropriate. Third question is, within, this, within the structure here, your board reports to another board, which reports to another board, which reports to the government. Will you be making any recommendations to the government regarding change in that structure? Because certainly to date it seems like there's layers upon layers upon layers that aren't necessarily possibly required or indeed working. Um, the other um, uh, two questions, I think in fairness one was partially answered to Deputy Donnelly. Um, do you believe that you can keep this project within the 1.4 billion plus 300 million fit out? And the last question is, obviously we all hinge on the PwC report, uh, which, you know, I don't know, a lot of it's going to be similar, I, I would presume, to the Mazars report, but there are additional questions that have been asked. And um, what, is your, what are your intentions to do? What are your intentions to act? I know you can't prejudge what's going to be in it, but what would your intention be once that report is published? timeline-wise, as regards to reaction. So they're my five questions. Okay. Uh, firstly, on the offer to opt out, uh, my, my view is that if, if we were to negotiate a termination of the main contract with BAM and go to retender, that it would take an absolute minimum of a year and a half, and it could be two years or more if there were, you know, even longer if there were any challenge to get a new contractor in place. So that the state would be picking up the extra inflationary cost of that couple of year period. The state would be carrying the cost of the development board and the CHI board pre-start up for an extra couple of years. The current contractors would have to be paid for demobilising and you would have a further payment to remobilise the new people. Uh, there are a lot of long lead equipment items and materials on order now through not just the main building contractor but the mechanical and electrical contractors and the state would have to pay all the cancellation charges that went with them. So I don't think it would be good business for the state to stop the work now and and pretender it. I think it would end up costing money and would lead to a much later opening than would otherwise have taken place. So that's, that's my view Agreed. on that. Uh, on the board expertise required, I think board appointments are a matter for the minister. I don't think good, bad or indifferent that I or any chair should be. I'm, I'm just saying I'm not asking you about board members. I'm asking do you think you have the expertise? I sure. I, but I know, I know collect, collectively even I think the board is a matter for the minister. Okay. 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 It is true, but still there's a question. It's not true. But I, I, I'll get to that in a minute. You're okay. Okay. Uh, the, what are the questions? The, within the 1.43 billion, well, I've mentioned that there are the caveats around that. Uh, some, are, some are going to be decisions that have to be made. If there are design changes being proposed, there's going to have to be a decision. Is it worth incorporating them at this stage? You know, I have driven presumably by changes in medical technology or medical practice. It's going to be a decision there, something's going to cost more as to whether to incorporate it now or not. Uh, on inflation, inflation is going to be whatever inflation is. It's, it's not really anything I feel is under our control. And on the Mazars report and the PwC report, well, the PwC report will come out in a few weeks and I think the government will form its own view as to what to adopt from that report. It's not a government report though. Well, it's a report for the HSE, it's not, a, it's not our report either. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it's not a government report. Okay, but it's not our, it's not our report. Uh, on the Mazars report, the Mazars had a, report had a number of recommendations in it and certainly I would take one recommendation that was in it. Uh, the, the supervisory team, I suppose, needs to be reorganised a bit at this stage as we move out of the earlier design phase 
and the procurement phase into the construction phase and aspects of it need to be strengthened in that regard and I will be taking up recommendations there. Okay, the, the layers, I asked the one question last Oh, question. sorry, excuse me, on the layers. Well, again, you know that the, the layer of governance above us, yes, there are a lot of committees involved, but again, that's a matter for the HSC and the Minister. Why is that a matter for the HSC? Well, these are HSE committees, some of them. The, yes, the, the, uh, there, is, there is a HSE committee which is no. over the Children's Hospital. Uh, with respect, Deputy Kelly, there is a HSE committee. Well, that's not what it's called, and that's not what we were told. The Department of Health Committee. Of Health Committee. Part of, I, I thought, thought there was a HSE no. one as well. No. Well, if it is. Well, I, so, sorry, I still not If it, I, if I, it, I, it, I, if it, it is, it's news to us. Okay. Okay. So you're happy to work within those? Well, I will work with within whatever parameters I'm told. But to it's just peculiar. Sorry, my last question is just yeah. peculiar. As chair designate, you feel that within that, that it's normal or it's the right thing to do to report, in your words, to a HSE committee, which isn't firstly there, but secondly, even if it was there. The idea well, that you, wait a second, let me finish. The sure, idea that yes. you, as chair of a board that's building the hospital, reporting into a HSE committee is kind of defeats the purpose, possibly. Why, why were you said, you know? Well, the HSE is the sanctioning authority for the hospital. Yeah. So it's not at all inappropriate that the HSE would have some role in it. I mean, no, I'm, I'm not, deni not denying that. Sure, My sure. issue is just the layers. The oh, layers I, and, and I understand, but I think it's unreasonable to expect me to criticise the government structure that's there. I'm not, that's to, I'm the not expecting, I'm just asking you, or would you make recommendations or would you have a conversation or would, as chair, would you be putting forward your opinion on that? That's all I'm asking. Okay. And would you? Well, if I do, I'll, I'm afraid I will have to put it to the minister. Yeah, I agree. But I'm just asking, would you do that? Yes, I would. Okay. That's yes. all I want to yeah, know. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Deputy Kelly and Mr. Barry. Now, uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thank you, Chair. And I will be running um, to the uh, launch of the periodic report as well, so um, I'll be brief. First of all, the best of luck with it. Um, and I think we all sincerely wish you good luck, regardless of our political affiliations. Um, there's a couple of questions I would like to ask. Just on the issue of the board itself and obviously I don't want you to say anything which may affect any future relationships on the board um, but it is not an issue solely for the minister in terms of its membership. The legislation is very clear that the chair of the board nominates three members to the Minister for appointment to the Board. Um, so I'm just wondering if that is something you have looked at or you may be willing to look at, because um, obviously you're stepping in midstream uh, into a Board. And I don't know whether you've worked with any of these Board members in the past or if you have a, a relationship with them, a professional relationship with them previously. Um, or where you may take the opportunity to actually bring in some people that you have worked with uh, and you know their own um, experience. So that's the first question, whether that's something you're willing to look at um, or whether it's something you've already begun to look at. And the second one is in relation to, obviously you have vast experience uh, looking at your uh, CV last night, uh, even the international experience in project management. Uh, I'm sure you've uh, been involved in many tendering and procurement processes um, on a large scale. Um, and given that experience, I think one of the major questions which is starting to emerge from all of this is the process which was decided by the <coughs> Development Board in relation to the two-stage process. And just from your own experience, I mean, we know that they got the, the derogation from the Government Contracts Committee. Uh, we know that this type of derogation in terms of a two-stage process has only been taken up twice, once by the 
the Hospital Development Board and once in relation to <coughs> the Dunkettle uh, interchange and that's at a very, very early preliminary stage. So the Hospital Board would have um, probably been pioneers in relation to this particular type of procurement process and I'm just wondering if you have any experience from your previous uh, work in project management of this type of two-stage process um, and any commentary you may have in relation to that uh, and I'll come back then with a, a follow-up question. Okay, certainly, uh, Chairman and <coughs> De De Deputy Brown. Firstly, on recommendations regarding board members, yes, I think there's a vacancy on the board at the moment, but also, you know, post PwC and all of that, I will be discussing this with the Minister and I will be making a recommendation or two as to how the board might be, might be strengthened. Okay. And that's without any reflection on the board yeah. members who are, who are there at the moment. On the two-stage process, which is relatively new in the Irish context, the, the the more general process of awarding contracts against proximate quantities at an early stage and subsequently converting those to either fixed prices or guaranteed maxes or target prices or whatever is very commonplace throughout the world and can work very well and has the benefits of getting the work started much earlier than might otherwise be the case and very often helps in getting contractor input into design development and some of the procurement issues. So there are a lot of positives going with it. Uh, it, 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 was, it was certainly complicated this time around because the original tender documents uh, didn't capture the scope of the project as well as might have been the case and consequently there was far more left to be negotiated subsequently than might have been hoped. But, uh, but as a process there's nothing wrong with two-stage processes or variations on those such as you know in the UK an awful lot of work is done on target price basis. Uh, there, and there are, there are a lot of benefits to that sort of contracting process. It's more difficult in the public sector than it is in the private sector, because the public sector is understandably perhaps quite risk averse, whereas in the private sector, speed to market is often a much bigger driver than getting the minimal construction cost. Saving time is regarded as a lot more valuable than shaving a certain amount off the construction cost. So on the process, the processes and processes of that sort can work very well. That doesn't mean they have worked very well in this instance, of course. Okay. And does that surprise you, um, given that, I mean, we have an Office of Government Procurement, we have a Public Spending Code, we have the Development Board with all of that expertise, we had subcommittees dealing with procurement and tendering. I mean, to hear that the original tender documents didn't capture the scope of the project... Fully. Fully. Yes. Um, to me would be a little bit alarming because I mean if you're going to go down one of these routes in terms of getting a derogation for a two-stage uh, process like there was a, there was even a report done into the advantages and disadvantages of going down this road and one of the disadvantages was that um, it could lead to cost overruns if it's not done correctly in terms of having capturing the scope of the project, capturing the bills of quantities accurately, and, that, and that's what has transpired here. I'm not saying that is the sole reason for the overrun, but I, I, I do believe it has played a significant part in it. I mean, how can we get to that stage when we have all of this expertise? It, it's very hard to understand how the original tender documents wouldn't have captured the scope of the project fully. And I'm afraid I, I can't give you the answer to, to that. A PwC report may, may identify or, they may, or may not, I don't know. Okay. But I can't, I can't go back in time and say this is why they, it wasn't Okay. And here's the final question, Chair, the, the very final question, and it's a quick one. Just in, in terms of your um, role with the NRA, uh, I presume you were involved in many capital projects. Yes. Uh, and this, this is not a question to try and catch you out or anything, but how many of those projects would have had cost overruns themselves? And 
um, how would you have dealt with those if they had cost overruns? Well, you know, I would say we did literally hundreds and hundreds of projects during, during my time with the NRA and I wouldn't say, I couldn't give you a specific number. Okay. Our target, because we had annual funding and a multi-annual funding programme, our, our target on budget setting and on projects was to ensure that we delivered the outputs that we were supposed to deliver for the money we were getting. Individual projects, some would be over budget, more would be under budget. We would have thought that if you didn't have the occasional project going under budget, the budgets were probably being set too loosely. But you would, as I say, you would look and expect to have more coming under budget than over, so that on balance your programme was delivering the outputs it needed to deliver for the money that was getting spent. Okay. And you presume there would have been a very strict monitoring process? There would be very strict monitoring, but also there would be realistic assessment of the risks okay. on projects and allowances made accordingly. Because uh, it is desirable, of course, to try and capture as much of a project as you can within a single contract you know, and get that nailed down, but you never capture everything. No contractor is ever going to guarantee you a fixed final price against any contingency. They can't do it and stay in business, so you, you have to ass assess what are the risks and make appropriate allowances. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Deputy O'Brien, <clears throat> we're now going to move on to Deputy Durkin. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, Mr Barry uh, to this meeting, even though he's only a designate, I'm sure he's a good designate, and uh, that he will prove to be a, 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 a very um, appropriate appointment. Uh, two or three things. First of all, in relation to the multiplicity of boards associated uh, with the, the hospital, I raised that issue at the very first uh, meeting that we had with the Hospital Development Board uh, when it became obvious that there were some cost overruns. I think there's an absolute necessity to have a, a, an interaction between those boards. I don't think that they should be acting independently. Uh, the danger, and this is from previous experience in, in, in that particular area, the danger is that one or other group involved, or one interest involved, will, will lead the project in a particular direction, which could lead to the kind of thing that we've, that we've had now. If there's a, a regular interaction, and I mean weekly interaction. Uh, I think that it, you, you, you need the personnel from one board to have ex officio uh, uh, representation on, on the other board and likewise on, on all other boards that are associated. Otherwise, one or other will take off on, on, on a gallop that we have no control over at all. So that's just my advice. I wouldn't propose to, to advise Mr Barry at all, but uh, from past experience I think that that's important. The other thing is that the, the project, unfortunately, has got a bad press, and it, it is a question of, of a guesstimating what the overrun is, uh, and as time goes on, depending on who, with whom we speak, my colleague, uh, Deputy Stephen Donnelly, has, has um, uh, set it out from the very beginning, and the, the, there's no end to it at all, sadly, uh, having listened to him, and I've listened to him carefully, and I like him, he's a very nice fella, but I don't like to see over-exaggeration of, of, of costs, even to meet a political point. So the point I would make there, and I don't expect you to reply to this at all, by the way, but uh, the point is this, that the original guesstimate was way short of what it should be, to my mind. And I will certainly await PricewaterhouseCooper uh, and their report, which will identify the basis on which these figures were arrived at in the first instance. I believe there was no basis for arriving at figures uh, mentioned in the beginning at all. Now, if, if, if you want to quantify an overall, Mr Chairman, the lower you start, the bigger the overrun then after that. So everybody's interested to criticise the project to bring the, the, the original estimate or guesstimate down as low as possible. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Uh, a considerable effort was made within the board and boards to reduce the costs uh, between June and, and August uh, last year. And there was a small reduction compared to the overall cost, but not a huge reduction. And the point that I would be most worried about there is this, is that if this project were to, were to stall, it would be a national disaster. I think the consequences, 
in terms of costs would be massive. And I think that has been the experience of many, many other projects uh, throughout Europe, not only in this country, but throughout Europe. And there have been similar situations. I don't understand, and this question wasn't clarified for us, uh, I don't understand the 6,000 rooms involved in the project. I, I don't know whether they could be, could be um, I know some of those rooms are for equipment, some of them I presume are for consultation or consulting rooms or whatever the case may be, but we were never really told uh, what they were. And the more of those uh, uh, um, rooms that are provided, obviously the more expensive the, the, the project is going to be. However, so my, my, my question there would be, if there is a benefit in reducing the, the rooms, uh, and at this stage I don't know what's in those rooms, presumably equipment and presumably some for, for consideration, but they could be reduced provided it doesn't undermine the overall trust of what the hospital is about. The other one is that um, I think that, that um, the project uh, could still uh, accommodate more. Uh, there's no reason why it can, why it still could go up or be revised further. Without, with, without I know there would, there would have to be a, a planning application, and we know how, how fickle they can be. But I think that, uh, nonetheless, I think we should we should look at the work. It's a 12-acre site, I think. It's about 12 acres in an overall site in the hospital of about uh, three times that or four times that, as far as I know. I know that I was approached uh, in the last while about a possible um, rearrangement of traffic in a way that would reduce the, t the, 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 the costs. That might be a possibility. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, with, the, with the traffic movements in the area to the extent that I could comment on it with, with any kind of authority. But it could be a possibility. But the most point that I want to make is this, Mr. Chairman. This hospital has been sought and, 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 and campaigned for over the last 30, 40 years. It has never materialised. It has never materialised because there was never an agreement as to where it should be. And there never will be. And if it was to wait for another 40 years, there will never be an agreement as to where the optimum location is. And that's a fact. And the reasons are because, as you know, Chairman, there's such a thing as medical politics, there's such a thing as politics, and there are, there are, there are objectives uh, and, and chosen objectives by various people, um, many in good faith. But if we're going to make progress, we're not going to do it by postponing everything forever. And it's not in the interest of children's health that we do that. It hasn't been in the interest of children's health that the hospital has been built heretofore. It should have been built at least 20 years ago. And, and, and it was for, what it, for, for a whole variety of reasons. So what I would say is this, is, is that, the, the, and yes, and the other question that comes to my mind is the fitting out, Mr. Chairman. The fitting out is an add-on in all hospitals. Uh, apart from the construction costs and everything else, the fitting out is expensive. I remember when Beaumont Hospital was fitted out and it was, it was, it was left idle for, what, nearly a year, a year and a half or something like that, uh, while awaiting the fitting out. So there's an extra cost involved, and that's an add-on. So there's no good somebody saying to us, we knew that was what the cost was going to be. We didn't. We don't know when the fitting out costs are clearly identified. And the last point I want to make, Chairman, is this, is that I cannot for the life of me understand why uh, uh, detailed specification and quantity surveyors uh, reports uh, are not always required before proceeding with a particular project in order to protect everybody. Because if we go to guess the outcome, and I'm not suggesting that it was a guess, but certainly estimates, uh, rough estimates or whatever, even precise estimates, are not, are, not, are not something that we should indulge in in a project of this size. And I would just simply say this. This hospital is needed. Uh, it needs to be in accordance with the requirements and, and the, as sought and, and petitioned for over many years. It would be a huge, huge disappointment to the families of sick children and the sick children themselves if it were to be delayed indefinitely while a political wrangle takes place as to where it should be and how it should be costed. And don't forget, this is not the first place this hospital was. It was first moved from the matter uh, and all number of sites have been, have been uh, 
proposal this. And is it, the present proposal incorporates both, both two other hospitals, Blanchetown and, 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 uh, and Tal as well. And, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a, a fairly comprehensive proposal that shouldn't at all be dismissed as, as some people are dismissing it, like uh, that it, it, you know, it's, it, we shouldn't have this. We have already spent money, well, by we, somebody spent money somewhere over the last 10, 15 years, and very little to show for it yet. So let's, let's proceed, and let's proceed cautiously, let's proceed carefully, and let's ensure that the hospital is at least of the standard and, and par with that throughout the world that we would hope it should be. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Um, Mr Barry, have you had Well, simply I, I would note and thank Deputy Durkin for his advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's what meant to be. That's the same bet, that's the same bet, Mr Chairman. <laughs> same bet. <laughs> Can I just ask one question and that's in under the 2040 project, there's, um, you know, it's planned to spend over 10 billion in relation to hospital infrastructure. Uh, do you believe at this stage, in view of what has occurred here, that we actually should set up a, a formal structure to do, and uh, you know, I suppose have a, you know, in the way that the National Roads Authority took on the roads, and uh, as a result, acquired huge experience as it went on, and therefore became extremely efficient in relation to the delivery of road infrastructure. Do you believe that we should now set up something similar in relation to hospital development, that, would, that there would be a core group of people who would be specifically responsible for uh, the management and the rollout of specific hospital projects? Well, the, as I understand it, and I'm subject to correction on this, but as, as I understand it, the HSC would be the sanctioning authority for at least most, if not all, of those hospital investments. Yes. And as such, I would expect and sort of assume that the HSC would have a group within it uh, overseeing projects. But what their structure is around that, I, I don't know at this stage. Would, it, but would you agree that it's time to look at that and to bring in... You well, that would be implying that the HSE haven't already looked at it, and I, I don't know where they are on this, or I don't know what their oversight arrangements are but, but in we, relation to hospital projects. We have not heard point. of any structure, formal structure being set up, and I'm talking about people with the expertise that you have uh, becoming involved in a structure in the same way as what we did with the national roads, rollout of national road uh, development, that we need to do this, the exact same thing in relation to the rollout of hospital infrastructure? Well, on the roadside it worked very well and is continuing yeah, to, work, to work very well. Uh, but how that ties in with what the HSC has at the moment, I can't tell you. I'm sorry. Yeah, but there is I, a 10 I, I, billion, there is a 10 billion program okay. for okay. hospital it, capital indeed, spend. But, but my knowledge base around the HSC's structures and management process and everything is, are very light. Uh, now, sorry, Deputy, Deputy Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, you're very welcome, Mr. Barry, and um, thank you for com coming in, and I wish you luck in, in your role. It's uh, not, not an easy one, but uh, I say no better man for the, for the job, so good luck to you. Um, Mr. Barry, a lot of what I wanted to ask and say has been said already, uh, but just two things, please. Um, I know you're just the build side of things, as you said earlier, and you said that things wouldn't be significantly different if they had been done properly, I suppose, for the want of a better word, with tendering and all that. So, in your opinion, it, like, was the whole thing an underestimation rather than an overspend? And if so, how do you think that this happened? And also, um, was we all admit that it was a bad start this overspend and public perception is is very bad i think everybody believes that the hospital is needed and wishes it look etc but uh, i think we, we all agree that it, it had a bad start so and i know this probably isn't in your remit as such but how do you think that the public perception can be changed because of of what happened Thank you, Mr. Barry. So, certainly, uh, Deputy Murphy, Chair. Uh, 
How did the underestimate? Sorry, I, I, I do think there was an underestimate. I'm, I'm not saying that the cost would have come out exactly as they have done if that hadn't happened. As I say, with competitive tension, there might have been a slight improvement in the pricing, but it wouldn't have been an order of magnitude different. Right. How did it happen? I can't answer that. I'm hoping PwC will come up with some of the answers, but they've had some months examining all the documentation and everything, so they will have a more detailed knowledge okay. than I have at this stage on that. It is, it is certainly unfortunate that what is a very much needed hospital now has the aura of the cost issue hanging around yes. it. And what can be done about that, I suppose, is we have to build it and it has to be a great facility for people. And eventually, if it works really well for the public, the memory, then will be gone. The memory of the rest will, fa will fade. Yes, yes. Will fade. But, that, but that delivery of something that people really value is... Yes. The only way I can That's think of no. to, to re-establish the benefits of it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you. thank you, Deputy Murphy. Deputy O'Connell. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming in, and I wish you the very best of luck. Um, thank you very much. I'm a, a big supporter of the Children's Hospital on its current site, um, so um, I'm, I'm very happy that you've taken up the role and that finally we can get this project delivered. Um, just, I know you've answered a certain amount of questions here, historic questions, and I'd like to focus on where we go now, because. If you drive by, drive by the James's site, um, it's coming out of the ground, as you know. Okay. And um, there's still co commentary in the media and in, po in political circles. We had a debate here last night on the site. So perhaps you might just briefly outline to the committee um, where we are in terms of there's, there's an idea out there that there's a hole in the ground and there's nothing else. So perhaps initially you could, could outline to me what is the reality of what's on the ground. As Deputy Durkin said, there's been me medical politics, regular politics, all sorts of um, groups involved in this project. But um, I suppose from now we have to look at how to finish this hospital. There's a, there's a bit of commentary. I understand the, the, the estimates issue um, that you discussed, that perhaps it was poor calculation of quantities, bills of quantities, and the inflation within the market at the time of design. I understand that. Um, but in terms of, there's been mention of de-scoping and we all know if we want a fancy kitchen we have to sometimes take off the curved cupboards or we have to take off the brass taps or we have to put on whatever on the floors. In terms of, 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 of de-scoping and in terms of pulling back on costs, is there any room or can you say that yet? So I know there's a portion of aluminium cladding on the outside, there's some stonework, I obviously haven't studied the entire building. But just to maybe, excuse the pun, set in stone today, um, can we put an end to this de-scoping conversation or is there room there for a cost saving to the future? Um, again, this conversation around the 6,000 rooms, um, it's almost like there's 6,000 you know, rooms that there's no need for. But for anyone who's been in an intensive care, a high dependency uh, children's ward, you might, if it is within your remit, to elaborate how many rooms um, off a main room you might need. I know from Crumlin they're very, very jammed at the minute. There's no treatment rooms in terms of isolation for chemotherapy children, immunocompromised. So it's not six regular little rooms, but you might, if you can, elaborate to the committee. And um, there's been a lot of conversation on fire, and I just want to make sure that th the message is out there, if it is correct, that there are safe burn times, there is no issue with having car parking in the basement, um, and in terms of cladding and finishes in light of Grenfell, are you satisfied that our children will be safe if there's a fire and that the proper response times to get them out of the building? Um, in terms of equip, equip is under your remit, isn't it? So does equip mean um, computers, as in fixed hardware, um, telephones, things like that, kettles, or does equip mean MRI machines, X-ray machines, or does it mean all of that? And in terms of how we're going to go forward, if it has been discussed, um, I know we discussed it as a committee some years ago, um, maybe two years ago, um, about how we go about maintenance of equipment. And I know I brought it up here about there's always issues with um, the maintenance people in a hospital when it comes into take, taking new roles on, training, 
um, in terms of depreciation of equipment. I know in retail, um, equipment is often leased now, and there's a maintenance contract, and it tends to be, well, if retail is doing it and commercial is doing it, it tends to be the best option. Have you, or have, have your team, are you looking into that model of perhaps obviously owning the phones and the computers, but when it comes to large, expensive machines that may be rendered out of date in a short period of time, um, what way are you looking to, to divvy up that bill? Um, thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Deputy O'Connell. <coughs> a number of <laughs> different, different topics there. Firstly, on the side question, uh, there is certainly a great big hole in the ground with an enormous amount of piling around it. There is a four-storey building, four building already in place on one side of that, one part of it, and there's another coming out of the ground. So there's an awful lot of work done on the site already. The idea of moving to a new location now should really be put from everybody's mind. Uh, this was Board Planola turned down this job going in the matter site. To, it gave permission for where it is in St. James's. If you went to another site, you have absolutely no certainty that Board Planola won't turn it down again. And if that happens, you're into five, six years before you could even start tendering and everything again. If the project is to be delivered, it needs, at this point, it needs to be delivered where it is. On descoping, there has been extensive value engineering and descoping and so on, and pretty well everything that can be gleaned from that has been gleaned. There are still some bits and pieces going on, but as I, I, I mentioned a little earlier, they will only generate very modest savings in the overall context. Things like the facade, I think the facade is in order. It's been manufactured. You know, so, I mean, we, we, are, we are much further along, even though on the construction on the site it's only starting to come up from the basement levels, there are orders in place There's for equipment times. already. There's lead times for all this, step. long lead times. So there isn't a whole lot left to be done there. On the number of rooms, I'm not a hospital programmer and I have, have no knowledge as to how many rooms are needed, but I know that what is there has come out of the user requirements signed off by the HSC and the Children's Health uh, Board and so on, who will be using the hospital. So the, the decision about rooms, it isn't somebody just conjuring up, maybe we'll have lots of rooms that has been determined by the experts who will actually be managing and running the hospital. On the fire certs, yes, the hospital, I think, has fire certs, and there's some more work to be done there in getting those, but I know that work has been done already in adding sprinkling into the hospital to make it even safer, and the cladding issues that arose in Glen at Grenfell have been reflected on and incorporated into the design. Uh, on equipping, the equipping role is actually shared somewhat between ourselves and CHI. So, say, on the computers, we're going to be putting in a lot of the wiring and all of that, and they'll be buying the actual computers, so we'll have an integrated approach there. On the, uh, the equipment, the hospital equipment imaging and all of that, we're buying, certainly I know a lot of it, the hospital at CHI may be buying some other equipment, I don't know. On the question of buying that directly or using a managed equipment service on it, I know that has been a topic of significant discussion before I've come along. I think some decisions have been made on that, but I'm not part of those discussions because I'm coming in after the event. Perhaps um, we could request um, as a committee that we find out from whoever knows what, where the discussions are on that and, and so we don't end up in sort of a similar estimate versus cost in We'll get you a note. We'll certainly we'll get the committee a note on yeah, that. Yes. Yeah. So just in terms of roles, it's, it's to me it's important. If your role is the phones and the computers, and CHI's role is the MRIs, well, we need to make sure there's a division there. In terms yeah, indeed, of, yeah. and a clear one. Yeah. Yes. Will do. <clears throat> thank you, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Barry. Um, Mr. Barry, just um, before we wind up, and yes. thank you very much for coming in, and the best of luck in your new position. Thank you very much. Um, it's probably not an ideal uh, entry into the project to come in halfway through uh, replacing the, the previous chairman, so I'm sure that carries its own difficulties with it. Could you outline to the committee how you propose to identify and um, make uh, the relevant people aware of any further cost overruns? We've spoken about the 4% inflation, if it goes above that, that would be a, a, an additional cost. Um, if the project was to run over time, it's due to 
be completed in mid-2022 if it was to run over time. Obviously, that would be an additional yes. cost. There are costs which are outside the control of the board if there's changes in PRSI or VAT. Uh, yes. That, that would have a, a, a cost implication. But also, the, the government has set up a review or is proposing to set up a review, um, a scenario analysis to look at any future um, unidentified costs that may develop. So how would you, as the chairperson of the board, um, d deal with those items, uh, identify them as early as possible and communicate them to uh, the different layers above you? I think the, 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 the layer directly above the board is chaired by the uh, Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the Department of the HSE. And then above that, there's a board which is chaired by uh, the Secretary General of the Department of Health. Yes. So, so that there are no additional surprises in relation to cost overruns, how, how would you propose to uh, make those known if they do occur? Well, firstly, of course, if, if, there are, if there are cost pressures leading to increases, we need to identify them ourselves, and we will be having a very keen focus on costs and where we are on costs uh, on a on an ongoing basis. I mean, we have monthly board meetings and we'll be getting detailed cost reports and forecasts at all of those meetings. And if we start forecasting that costs are going above the current 1.43 billion, we will be flagging that immediately to everybody else involved. I mean, I do think that one of the, one of the disappointing things in the process so far was that the actual costs were recognised rather late in the day and we'll try and avoid anything like that happening again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Barry, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you very much for coming in. Uh, the committee will be writing to the minister to say that we have engaged with you, and that will allow him to yes. proceed. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank Chairman. Well. We're now going to adjourn for a few moments to allow our next group of witnesses to take yes. their seats.
two sections to, to, to this meeting this morning. Um, we're going to look at the, the National Cancer Strategy 2017 to 2026 and to examine how it's operating on the ground. In this session, we're going to hear from representatives from Cancer Trials Ireland, the Irish Cancer Society, and from the, H, uh, the Health Research Board. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome Ms. Evelyn Mulrow, CEO of Cancer Trials Ireland, and Professor Brian Hennessy, Clinic and Lead, Cancer Trials Ireland. Ms. Averill Power, Chief Executive of the Irish Cancer Society, and Mr. Donald Buggy, Head of Services of the Irish Cancer Society. And finally, Dr. Darren Morrissey, Chief Executive of the Health Research Board, and Dr. Mairead O'Driscoll, Director of Research Strategy and Funding, Health Research Board, to our meeting this morning. Thank you. I wish to draw your attention to the, effect, to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that <clears throat> where possible, possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against any person outside of the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. In relation to the opening statements, because we have uh, two sessions, we have six sets of witnesses, uh, perhaps you might c confine your opening statements to three or four minutes. Uh, we have received the opening statements. So just to summarise them, if possible. Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Hennessy. Okay, um, thank you, Chair and Members, for inviting us here this morning. I'm Clinical Lead of Cancer Trials Ireland, and I'm joined by our CEO, Evelyn Mulrow. We're delighted to be here to discuss the implementation of the research-related key performance indicators of the strategy, the National Cancer Strategy, and we also want to raise awareness of the value of clinical trials in cancer treatment. So I'm a consultant medical oncologist, and I'm also a professor of medicine at the Royal College of Surgeons, as well as an adjunct professor in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Centre. Cancer Trials Ireland is a charity set up by doctors, nurses and scientists in cancer care to work on trials across cancer disease areas. There are over 500 members and we come together regularly to develop ideas and set up cancer trials. We have 130 cancer trials underway in Ireland. These trials involve thousands of patients and are how we develop new effective cancer treatments. Ireland has the know-how to do more of these trials and by increasing investment in cancer trials infrastructure we will be offering Irish cancer patients more options and potentially better outcomes. Cancer trials can extend lives and improve quality of life. When I'm in the clinic with a cancer patient there are times I want to be able to offer more than the standard of care and that's where a trial can help. At the moment, I know due to resource constraints in our cancer units and head office, there are trials that we simply cannot do at the moment. So in terms of cancer, it's a genetic disease. It's caused by changes in DNA, changes that can be inherited, but most arise randomly during a person's lifetime. Globally, the landscape of cancer trials is changing as we move away from treatments that are based on previous understanding of cancer site of origin like lung or breast or pancreatic cancers and move more towards targeted studies where we look for this, the same DNA change, mutation in a variety of cancer types. And these trials are very specific but they have smaller patient numbers and are replacing the larger one-size-fits-all trials that we used to do in the past. Ireland can and does participate in these new trial types of trials which are important for patients and in these trials we are testing whether certain targets in cancers respond to specific new treatments in the context of, a, of cancer trials where patients are monitored at the highest level. 
So our recommendations, we need to take steps to implement the National Cancer Strategy of 2017. The previous strategy in 2006 was a game changer for cancer care. We in Cancer Trials Ireland believe this one could be a game changer for cancer research. As many of you on the committee are aware, we need to be ready to take on the challenge that a two-fold increase in the incidence of cancer in Ireland over the next 20 years is going to pose. In that context, fostering a research culture in our hospitals is important and will create more treatment options for patients through our activity. The target, KPI 20 in the new strategy, to double the number of people with cancer who can access cancer trials from an estimated 3 to 6 percent by 2020 would not only have saved the HSE millions in euros in drug costs, but it would also provide more patients with access to promising new treatments that would otherwise not be available. But because of cuts to our funding, we're actually going in the wrong direction at the moment. In 2018, the numbers we have collected so far suggest that only 348 patients were newly recruited to cancer trials in 2018. And according, and according to the last report by the NCRI, there were 22,321 new cases of cancer in the same year. The equivalent figures in 2014 were 664 new patients on trials and about 21,000 new cases of cancer, which led to the calculations of the baseline figure of 3%. So in order to support NCCP <coughs> achieving this KPI and other research-related KPIs, Cancer Trials Ireland is calling for support from this committee to reverse the 20% funding cut to its HRB grant, which supports its Cancer Trials Research Units and General Central Office. We need an additional 1.2 million euros per year to Cancer Trials Ireland research units and our central office over the next three years to increase activity and bring patient numbers up to and above the 3% on clinical trials baseline. We need protected time for clinicians and medical teams so that they can do more research and foster a culture of research in our hospitals. And we recommend that the NCCP makes available a ring-fenced fund to which Cancer Trials research units can apply for multi-year funding for staff and capital to ensure continuity and to build up human capital in each unit. While the HRB grant covers costs, it is not sufficient funding to provide a stable platform for individual research units to do more. Thank you. So I will now hand over to my colleague, Evelyn Mulrow. Thank, Thank you, you Professor Hennessy. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, and it's great to be here today. The implementation of the National Cancer Strategy, as, as Professor Hennessy has talked about, could take us significantly closer for more options for cancer patients. To date, we've been enabled through funding received from the Irish Cancer Society who contribute 485k per year. The Health Research Board contribute 3 million per year and 2 million of this is distributed amongst our 11 cancer units in our hospital sites. And this employs people um, to work on clinical trials. In 2006, the figure for the hospital sites was 3.8 million. That's almost half. We also received kind support from St Luke's Cancer Research Fund of 165k. The other half of our income is generated through sponsoring our own investigator-initiated studies. There are trials. We run them. We come up with the ideas, but they're funded by pharmaceutical companies working um, and, and also working with international collaborative groups like us to bring international trials to Ireland. Patient involvement is key to us in Cancer Trials Ireland. Cancer Trials makes a direct impact on Irish patient lives and it's important for this committee to reflect on that. In our submission on the 6th of March we included true life stories of people and their experience. There are many more stories of people who have lived longer with improved quality of life because of their participation on a trial. They have been there for family, major life events and more importantly for their children and for their grandchildren. There are many misconceptions concerning participation on clinical trials and we try to stimulate public conversations about trials through our Just Ask Your Doctor campaign. We are humbled that so many patients are willing to advocate for cancer trials on our behalf. We've established a patient consultants committee and some members of that committee are joined with me here today. We are, and, and we are very appreciative of that. Patient involvement in the decisions we make and the research we, we do is of strategic importance to the organisation. Our challenge at the moment, as outlined by Professor Hennessy, is we can report little movement on the implementation of the research KPIs. And due to our reduced, reduced funding, we have had to decline opening clinically important academic trials. 
and with people with a range of cancers, including lymphoma and testicular and endometrial cancer, have actually lost out. We are unable to, to be proactive in exploring opportunities to open new trials in areas like pancreatic, lung, testicular and cervical cancer. This is a direct result of reduced funding. The work at our office and at our hospital sites is highly specialised and subject to a detailed quality management system with over 50 SOPs designed by us and frequently inspected by the HPRA. Patients in Ireland on clinical trials can take comfort in the knowledge that their welfare is monitored at the highest level in healthcare, but it costs to do more, to maintain quality standards. Therefore, we need increased funding from the Department of Health, the Health Research Board and a budget commitment for the NCCP for research at our hospital cancer units and head office. The medium term objective of Cancer Trials Ireland is to test and prove treatments that kill cancer and stop it in its tracks. One very important difference between cancer trials and all other cancer research is that having a, it has a profound impact on the lives of people with cancer today. Trials deliver in the medium and, in the medium and immediate term. Today our trials are providing patients with access to proven but not yet available treatments that can save their lives. There are people on trials today who would not be alive. If they did have access to one of our trials, that would be different. So it is really important for decision makers to understand that when funding for trials is reduced, life-saving treatments for patients today can be removed. Their options are reduced. Is this a wise approach? We believe not. Thank you. We would like to take this opportunity, as we have it, to thank the 15,000 Irish patients who have volunteered on our trials over the last 20 years. They have made a difference for future generations of cancer patients. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms Mulro. And now, can I ask Ms Avril Power to make your opening statement? Thank you. Chairman, committee members, thank you for inviting the Irish Cancer Society before your committee hearing this morning. My colleague Donald Buggy, our Head of Services, and I appreciate the opportunity to outline the patient perspective on the National Cancer Strategy. Thirty years ago, when we first celebrated Daffodil Day, only three out of ten Irish patients survived a cancer diagnosis. Today, six out of ten do. And that is thanks in no small part to the investment in cancer research by ourselves, Cancer Trials Ireland, the HRB and others, as well as the significant improvement in cancer services in Ireland under our two previous national cancer strategies. For example, the centralisation of cancer surgery under the 2006 National Cancer Strategy has ensured that more patients are being treated by healthcare professionals with more experience and expertise in their particular type of cancer, and thousands of lives have been saved as a result. However, Ireland's cancer outcomes still lag behind other European countries, and it was this that the 2017 Irish Cancer uh, Strategy set out to tackle through a focus on prevention, early diagnosis, providing an integrated model of care where patients get a package of supports from multidisciplinary teams, and improving treatment, particularly in rare cancers and those where our outcomes are still very poor. Crucially, the 2017 strategy also recognised the importance of patient involvement in their care and of improving quality of life for cancer survivors. It stressed the importance of research, of investment in cancer research as a key driver of innovation and the way, as Ms Moreau has pointed out from CTI, of ensuring access for patients to life-saving medicines that they simply wouldn't get otherwise. It also highlighted that sufficient support for the National Cancer Control Programme and effective workplace planning were essential to delivering change. The Irish Cancer Society was proud to sit on the steering committee for the development of the 2017 Cancer Strategy under the leadership of Professor John Kennedy, who is a former chairman of the Society. We believe that it is a visionary document that puts the needs of patients at its heart and which implemented would reduce the number of Irish people getting cancer in the coming years and also increase survival and quality of life for those who do. That is why it is so disappointing that there seems to be very little momentum behind its delivery. According to the implementation report published in February, six out of seven interim targets due to be met by the end of 2018 were missed. Even worse, the HSE's 2019 services plan explicitly states that the NCCP allocation for this year 
will not enable the service to match referral demands in areas such as radiotherapy, rapid access clinics and diagnostics. So not only have resources not been provided to the NCCP to deliver the new initiatives promised in the strategy, inadequate funding has been given to deliver existing services to an increasing number of cancer patients. This is truly shocking and will have a major impact on cancer patients and their families. One of the six missed targets was to ensure patients are diagnosed earlier, thereby increasing their chances of survival. We recently heard from a woman whose GP had recommended she attend a breast clinic to investigate some worrying symptoms. She told us that her doctor had told, us that, told her that her case was urgent and that as such she should be seen at the clinic within two weeks. Still waiting for an appointment, she rang her nurse line very upset. She was incredibly worried, anxious and distressed, thinking about a possible cancer growing inside her while she was still waiting to be seen. At the end of 2008, 95% of people classified as having breast cancer symptoms needing urgent investigation were supposed to be seen within two weeks, but only 75% were. Nine out of ten patients with certain cancers were to have surgeries within the timeline set out in the strategy. Only seven out of ten did. Nine out of ten patients starting radiotherapy treatment were meant to start within 15 days of being ready to do so, and only ten, eight out of ten did. Every missed target affects real people. The mother with a lump in her breast, the father with blood in his urine, the healthcare professional trying to do the best for their patients in a chaotic health service. Publication of the National Cancer Strategy 2017 was a step forward, but underfunding and underperformance are two steps back. One in two of us, Chairman, will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetime. When we are, we deserve the best chance. We deserve the standard of care promised in the 2017 National Cancer Strategy. Unless action is taken now, this will not happen. Instead, with more cancer patients and insufficient resources, standards will slip. That's why we're calling on the committee today to help us ensure that the strategy is implemented by pushing for a more detailed implementation plan with clear funding, and including for the big infrastructural and capital projects outlined in the strategy, increased investment in cancer research, including clinical trials, and investment in CTI to provide the essential basic infrastructure for those trials to take place, a clear plan and timeline for delivery of at least one comprehensive cancer centre, completion of the centralisation programme, and action to fill gaps in the data and baseline figures so that implementation of the strategy can be properly monitored. Your constituents, your friends, your families and your communities deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Power. And now, um, Darren Morrissey, please, your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you to the Chair, to the committee members, um, on behalf of myself and my colleague, Mairead O'Driscoll, for the invitation to present and answer some questions today. The health research saves lives, but turning <coughs> research discoveries into real benefits for, for people's health and patient care doesn't happen by itself. The Health Research Board, the HRB, supports great ideas, the infrastructure and people to come together to make research potential a reality. And the HRB, under the auspices of the Department of Health, is the leading Irish agency funding health research today. Our annual budget is €45 million, Euro, and we manage an active investment portfolio of, of around €170 million. But we fund across a broad range of health research areas to prevent illness, to improve health, to enhance health and to inform policy. And these funding areas range from applied biomedical research, for example, studies into um, antibiotic drug resistance to support MRSA treatment, clinical trials, which I'm sure we'll talk about later today, uh, population health, for example, monitoring the impact of HPV vaccination in Ireland, and health, researchers, health services research, for example, delivering, delivering a standard assessment tool to reduce the number of ad adverse events happening in Irish hospitals. And our €45 million Euro annual funding uh, uh, pot also under, underpins the HRB's role in directly providing evidence to government to inform health and social care decision making. Some examples of, of work that the HRB Evidence Centre has done and contributed to in the last number of years has been the Public Health, uh, health Alcohol Bill regulation and financing of, of home care costs and policy on water fluoridation. 
And we also manage four health information systems across a range of areas uh, from drug and alcohol use to drug deaths, disability and mental health. So international evidence tells us that research active healthcare systems have better outcomes for patients and the HRB has been at the forefront in some of the key developments to enable better health and better health care in Ireland. The HRB has invested in an extensive network of three clinical research facilities, five clinical trial networks including Cancer Trials Ireland, a clinical research coordination um, uh, set, uh, Ireland hub that coordinates uh, um, Ireland's involvement in clinical trials. Uh, and a trial methodology research network to strengthen the approach taken to trials. And whether improving lives, prolonging lives or saving lives, health research must be patient focused. So the HRB has also been taking a lead on putting the patient first by encouraging and supporting researchers to involve the public in their research from the very start and supporting the public to participate in the review of research proposals. So moving on to cancer and cancer research, the HRB recently analysed the most recent available data spend across the system on health research from a range of public uh, funding agencies uh, and though, between the dates 2011 and 2015. The main agencies and government uh, departments uh, funded in that period of time a cumulative amount of 750 million into the system. And when we look at the spend on different disease areas, we found that cancer accounted for 20% of that national funding spend. This level of investment also refl is reflected in the HRB portfolio. So although we fund uh, across all disease areas and across a number of cross-cutting areas as well, approximately 20% approximately of all of the HRB's revenue budget is allocated to cancer research. This pattern of expenditure uh, on cancer mirrors and is not out of kilter at all with other countries. So the UK, for example, has about 20% of its national funding in health uh, uh, devoted to, to cancer. Uh, and in, uh, in Norway, about 25% of all cancer uh, health research funding is devoted to cancer. Although it, do, it has to be acknowledged uh, that compared to other countries, Ireland spend relative, rel is relatively little on research when you compare it against the proportion of total health spend. So in absolute terms, the 2011 to 2015 period, the HRB allocated 50 million to cancer research and um, across all agencies the total number was 93 million. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the next largest funder uh, was Science Foundation Ireland with a spend of thir over 30 million. So on to the National Cancer Strategy. We at the HRB welcome this review of the National Cancer Strategy and the fact that more attention is being given to research as part of that review. We have three recommendations specific to the research area that, that we, uh, we, we, um, we believe would drive the research agenda for cancer in the future. Firstly, we recommend the urgent establishment of the National Cancer Research Group as laid out in the, the existing uh, strategy recommendation 46. Um, as noted in the cancer strategy, there is need for better coordination between different initiatives, research entities and government agencies, and this would be accomplished through the establishment of a National Cancer Research Group. So we view this as being a very important action for 2019, and it would be required to involve a range of stakeholders from the Department of Health, the NCCP, uh, HSE, and all funders, including um, uh, funders uh, from the charity sector like the Irish Cancer Society. And there are several ways in which the group could operate, and we have some suggestions as to how, how one might go about that. Secondly, we recommend the proactive fostering of a culture of cancer care in the cancer care system that truly values research by supporting the people and the leadership within an integrated health care system. As noted again in the, in the cancer strategy, there's a lack of recognition within the health care system that research is a relevant, vital and critical activity. And we strongly support the recommendation within the strategy to ensure that newly appointed cancer consultants and advanced nurse practitioners have protected time to pursue research. Uh, and the appropriate mechanisms must be put in place uh, in a, to make this a reality, not just in terms of employment contracts. Uh, so it's one thing to have it written in a contract, but actually delivering on it uh, is, is what is needed uh, day to day. And we recommend uh, additionally that the NCCP and HSE find a way to fund, or at least um, um, at minimum co-fund, more of the core positions in the research infrastructure, such as clinical research nursing, and data management, and this would free the HRB in its remit as a, as a, as a, as a research and cancer research funder uh, to move to war, uh, away from more basic infrastructural needs and invest in more trial activity, which would be good for patients and good for the system. 
And our third recommendation, and final recommendation, is, is that um, we recommend that serious efforts are made to build patient and public trust by improving the use of cancer data that already exists in an open and transparent manner. Now, this is linked to the existing uh, cancer uh, strategy recommendation 52. The National Cancer Registry Ireland is a world-class piece of data infrastructure uh, at that at a high level informs us about the incidence and mortality of all cancers in Ireland. However, many other data sources already also exist, for example, disease-specific registries, population cohort data such as TILDA, which you'll have heard about, and the HYPE data set. If these uh, data sets were linked in a safe, controlled and trustworthy manner to the NCR data, this could provide valuable insights into cancer in the Irish population, for example, linking information on cancer uh, incidence and mortality to information on demographics, socioeconomic indicators and lifestyle, and that would help us to target cancer treatment and diagnostics and deliver more effective uh, prevention strategies. So we recommend that a national health data project be initiated using principles established in the HRB's proposal on enabling data environment for health research in Ireland, which we euphemistically call the, the DAZL model, uh, which was published in 2016, with an initial focus on cancer. The HRB, be, HRB believes that a focused and concerted effort, given Ireland's size, relatively centralised uh, health system, well-connected ecosystem and growing sense of citizen engagement could uh, could, could make Ireland a leader in health data management and use. And a critical first step in that project would, would as I said before, be to develop trust uh, from patients. And this could be achieved through citizens' assembly style meetings to build understanding of the concept, gain buy-in, and establish safe uh, data sharing and linkage uh, principles. And we believe this would lay foundations for people to benefit fully from the advances in genomics and precision medicine that are and will be increasingly important in cancer treatment. So thank you for the opportunity again to present, uh, and Mairead and I are, are very happy to take questions from now on. Thank you very much, Dr Morrissey. <clears throat> We're now going to open proceedings to our members, and our first member to contribute is Deputy Margaret Murphy. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying that my colleague, Deputy Donnelly, had to go to the doil and he would be back, so you, you're, you're not escaping him. <laughs> you might want to. Um, first of all, uh, you're all very welcome here today, and I suppose on behalf of the public, I'd like to thank you all for the fantastic work that you all do in, in the field of cancer. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge, I suppose, the big success that Daffodil Day is. Um, there, where I'm from in West Cork, it's just one of the busiest days uh, of the whole year, and I'd just like to acknowledge the sense of volunteerism that is alive and well in Ireland, and just say well done to everybody involved in, in the day. Um, Professor Hennessy, you spoke about uh, the value of the clinical trials, and that really is an understatement, like I just, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you for the work you do because you certainly do save lives. So, so well, well done to you. Can I just ask you how you decide who's offered the trial and and who's not? And also, you spoke about uh, going backwards. Is that totally down to funding, or are there other factors? Please. Okay. Well, thank you for the questions. Um, I'll take the second question first. Um, like I said in, in, in my opening statement, um, the baseline figure that we use to, to, in terms of the number of people with cancer, diagnosed with cancer, who go on trials is 3%, and, and that was calculated from 2014 figures. The strategy recommends that we double that, and that is because as, uh, as other speakers have said, also international evidence points to the fact clearly that research active healthcare systems have better patient outcomes. Um, but the problem at the moment is we've actually, since calculation of that baseline figure, have gone backwards. Um, and the figure at the moment for 2018 is more like 1.5%. And absolutely, that is mainly down to cuts to our. To, to, um, funding um, for cancer research nationally. Um, I think that's by far and away the biggest factor that's caused that drop. Um, and Evelyn yeah. can maybe speak further on that. Um, the, the second, or your first question was about how we choose who goes on cancer trials. So basically, I mean, in Cancer Trials Ireland, we, our research program looks to develop cancer trials for patients with 
different types of cancer. So um, di all of the different types of cancer, breast, colorectal, bowel cancer, lung cancer, um, and less common cancers too, like ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer. So we, 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 we subdivide different cancers into different areas, different parts of, I suppose, the cancer journey that are treated in different ways, and we develop trials in, in each of those areas. But there is, you know, we cannot cover all of the different um, priority areas and all of the different types of cancers with anywhere, anyway, nearly at the moment with the funding cuts that we've gone through. And we want to do that because people with cancer are entitled to, to cancer trials. I mean, when, when, a, when, a, when, for, when I see a patient or a person with cancer in the clinic, when a currently available treatments are no longer working for them, we can do nothing else to help them. And, you know, if there's a trial open that suits that person, it could offer a lifeline, it could offer a lifeline is hope. Okay. And many trials have and continue to offer hope for people in Ireland with cancer, but not enough people in Ireland with cancer. If there's no trial, there's no lifeline, there's no hope. And that's, that's not the best that we should be offering people. All, so all down to funding. Again. All down to funding. It is, and, and from a patient perspective, we're joined by Eddie McCone and Theresa McCone from our Patient Consultants Absolutely. Committee, I think yeah. from your home, home time. Yes. De um, Absolutely. Deputy. But, you, you know, and, and they've been on that journey um, on a clinical trial that we brought into this country from Australia. You know, it's an Australian trial, and our little not-for-profit <coughs> Irish group is sponsoring that trial, not only in Ireland, but in Europe, and, and patients are accessing, at the time, the drug involved in the trial wasn't available in Ireland, it wasn't approved, it wasn't licensed, it was a, an experimental drug, and people here wouldn't have had that opportunity, and it's, 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 you know, one thing that's really important is that the public understand trials are for everyone with cancer, irrespective of when you get diagnosed or where. So the in, that's why the, the, the incidence denominator kind of irritates me slightly because, you know, it's more the prevalence. We should be looking at 6% of the prevalence figure, which is nearly 173,000 people with cancer, living with cancer in Ireland. And, and I think what's important is our hospital sites, if you look at the number of trials we're running across the country, we're doing more in Dublin and Cork than we are in the west of Ireland and the north. And I think it's really important that we, we consider that um, in, the, in the strategy, that there's access for the whole country to trials. And, and you ask the question, how do you get on a trial? And one of the things we've started to do is ask, ask patients to ask their clinicians about trials. We have trials open. They're on our website. You can ask your clinician, and very often you could be referred to a trial. What's heartbreaking is when a person comes into a clinic like Brian's or another, and you know there's a trial happening across the water for the exact, the exact condition that this person has. We could do it. We have a list of trials in a queue that we can't open because we don't have the money to do it. And it's not just the money in our office, it's the nurses, it's the, dad in, in the hospitals that you all work with and represent, the nurses, the doctors, the data managers who work on those trials are, within the care journey, are, are, are maxed out. Um, so that's why integrating research trial staff within the hospital budget line items. I mean, I take the, the Health Research Board uh, talked about that, and I think it's really important to say that's where our trials happen for cancer. They happen in the cancer units in the hospital. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Eddie and Teresa and to welcome them to Dublin from, as you say, my hometown of, of Bandon. Um, just two more things, please. You all spoke about uh, there being more cancer patients why is this, you know, in your opinion, why is cancer gone more common? I know people are living longer, so obviously that, that's a factor. But, um, and also maybe if there's something can be done, in your opinion, to prevent it, um, you know, should people be more educated on, on prevention? And also a thing that has come to my notice just over the last few days of people uh, going into hospital to receive chemotherapy and because there's no bed that they're being sent home. So I'm just wondering, has this come to your notice? And um, obviously you would think it's shocking, but what, how common is it and, and what can be done about it? Because that's absolutely shocking just because there's no bed that someone is sent home and they miss out on that slot <coughs> of chemotherapy. If I can check that. Sorry, do you want, no, no, please. No, you go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. <laughs> um, Sorry, um, just to 
take those two questions, Chairman. Um, the cancer numbers are predicted by the NCRI to double in the next 25 years, and there are two main reasons for that. One is demographics, so cancer is predominantly a disease of, of older people, so as we live longer as a population, that means more people are likely to get cancer. Um, the other key reason is relation to lifestyle factors, issues like obesity, um, alcohol, tobacco, um, things that increase your likelihood of, of getting cancer. We're all born um, with a certain risk of, of getting cancers, and as um, Professor Hensi mentioned, um, many cancers are, um, your chances of, uh, occur randomly, um, but others are, are genetic. Um, but by drinking excess alcohol, not exercising enough, um, being overweight, we can we increase our likelihood, unfortunately, of getting cancer. So that NCRI, that NCRI prediction of cancer numbers doubling is just a prediction, and it is within our power as individuals, um, as an Oireachtas, as a society, to change that prediction and make sure that it doesn't happen to investment in cancer prevention, which is one of the main pillars of the National Cancer Strategy, and I think that's really important because we can save lives by making sure that less people get cancer in the first place by addressing cancer prevention. In relation to patients being sent home, um, when they've presented for appointments, it happens for all kinds of appointments, not just chemotherapy, but same for, for surgeries due to capacity issues in our hospitals. It's a um, constant sor source of distress for patients that call our nurse line or present at daffodil centres in, in hospitals. And as I mentioned, you know, even when patients are referred to rapid access clinics because they have urgent symptoms, the, incredible, the extra distress that comes from not being treated within the required time frame is incredible. Um, you know, for in terms of diagnostic tests, when someone has been told that they urgently that they have symptoms that require urgent investigation, sometimes you know when they actually get the test, they will be relieved to find out um, that that they don't have cancer, and that's a massive relief. But they will have spent that whole period worrying about it, worrying about a possible cancer growing inside of them, um, which is unnecessary and incredibly upsetting for patients. And tragically for others, they'll find that by the time they've actually got a diagnosis, their cancer may have progressed and be harder to treat than it would have been if they had been seen within the required time frame. So that is really shocking. And there are a number of issues, a number of causes of that. One is capital infrastructure, and that's why it's so important that the capital projects promised in the National Cancer Strategy are delivered on time, and that they're not delayed by things like the overrun at the Children's Hospital that you were discussing before us this morning. And it's also essential that workforce issues are addressed in the health service, and actually research investment is a key part of that. Um, because one of the reasons why many Irish trained consultants who have, and nurses and other health health professionals who have gone abroad to get experience don't come home is because they won't be able to do research here. Um, because they don't have protected time. So we train amazing healthcare professionals here to a very high standard. They go and work and get further experience in some of the best cancer centres in the world. Um, but then they have to face you know, the, the choice of, of coming home and not being able to do the kind of research that they can do in New York or they can do in Australia um, and New Zealand and other countries like that. And that's crazy because, as um, Professor Hennessy and, and Ms Monroe pointed out, patients do better in research active environments. And one of the reasons for that is that research active hospitals and healthcare settings attract the best healthcare professionals. The best people want to be able to carry out research, they want to make sure that their patients get access to new treatments and medicines, and they want to work in an environment where they have the time and the headspace and the access to, to treatment facilities to deliver the best care. They don't want to work in a system that, that's chaotic. So providing investment in research and protected time will also address the wider issues around attracting people home and filling the, the gaps in consultant nursing and other posts in the health service. Thank you, Ms. Power. And uh, Dr. Morrissey? Uh, so, thank you, Deputy, Mur Deputy Murphy. I've de I'm going to maybe just address aspects of all three of your questions. Um, for, for us, I think it's important to point out that we absolutely acknowledge uh, that cuts were made to the CTI budget um, over the, the last number of years. In line with this, and you know, in terms of the rationale for this, it's, it's clearly linked to the, to, 
the diminution in our in our in our own funding total funding pots over the period of time um, from 2018, 20, 2008 through to 2014. Mm -hmm. The the uh, HRB budget uh, shrank from 36.9 million on the revenue side down to about about 30 million. So you know in around that 20% cut. We actually held off um, in, in, in making passing that cut on to CTI um, for a good number of years. So it was around 2015 onwards that that happened. Um, not in any way justifying, you know, but it, it needed to happen to allow us to have a balanced portfolio uh, of investment. So you asked a very interesting question around, you know, why the increased numbers of cancer patients. Well, obviously, diagnosis is in there, you know, improved diagnostic yes. methods, but also there's increased survival, no doubt. Uh, but you then extended the question and spoke about pr cancer prevention, and clearly within there, it, we've increased our investment into areas of research around the whole areas of, of diabetes, of uh, obesity, of, of lifestyle, uh, and linked through to uh, evidence generation as well. Aware well, actually providing evidence to support the necessity to invest then in, in increased investment and, and who you target and how you target. So for us it's about balanced portfolio. However, what I would say as well is that we have made a submission to the Department of Health for increased funding for, for CTI and for, and for across our entire budget. Uh, that is under review currently and you know hopefully um, for our 2019 allocation there might be uh, a step towards phased, phased reversal um, uh, of, of those original cuts. Now I would say at the same time though, to, to go back to your opening question, our view is that it isn't just about cash, that in fact it's the, com the complexity of funding but also linked to what Evelyn um, and, and Averill and, and Brian have mentioned already, that blend of uh, support on the other side of the line in terms of infrastructure, <coughs> in terms of people supports and in terms of the people who actually deliver the, uh, the trials. So again, supporting it within the hospitals, uh, a, a better staffing, I suppose, more flexible staffing to allow for research time as well. So it's a complex blend. It isn't just all about research and direct funding. There's an indirect component to it as well that needs to be factored in. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to Deputy Alan Kelly. Oh, thanks, Chair. Sorry for jumping in and out. There's, we must work this out. The questions and committees sitting at the one time and all of that is not, not your fault, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for uh, coming in. Um, I have a number of uh, questions. <laughs> I'll start where you finished. In relation to your discussions with the department, firstly, well done on all your work and, um, and thank you. Um, in relation to the discussions with your department um, for, the, for the Health Research Board, it's quite obvious that you're managing a confined uh, budget. Um, that's really concerning to me. It's really concerning that there hasn't been a, a kind of a a breakthrough in relation to that budget in recent times, <coughs> because the knock-on effect is to you guys, all right, which is the knock-on effect to everyone. And like, if there's one illness or one topic that the public out there are like understanding everything uh, would want to see more funding gone into, it's this. So <clears throat> just you might elaborate for us to be able to help you considering who's coming in afterwards with us, because we timed it right, brought you in first. Um, how far down the road are you in relation to discussions uh, with the department regarding firstly your overall funding and secondly, obviously, then what you pass on to CTI? And the more information you can give us, the better. Okay, so since 2015, I suppose that would have been the the, um, the lowest point in, in, in terms of our revenue funding. So since since 2015, we've had incremental increases in budget, and I think that's really important to acknowledge at a time when the overarching um, uh, pot for funding across all different research funding wasn't particularly growing at pace. Um, the, the Department of Health were able to, to, to provide increased funding. So we're, so we're now up to, um, a, um, if the 2019 funding comes in, we will be at a, a revenue level of 34, 34 million, and then within the overarching uh, funding pot of around 45 million, approaching 46. So there is growth, and that has to be acknowledged. 
Uh, I think as well as that, there's some uh, important, what I would say is infrastructural changes that are happening within the, within the health research system um, that the Department of Health are driving, which are going to allow for more efficient and, and, and increased research activity uh, in future years. Uh, and these are things that would have been systemic issues in, in the system that were decades long and that are now being fixed. One of those, which is a bill that's been brought through um, uh, Cabinet, and which is a bill that, or, or rather that the, the heads of are being developed as we speak, but uh, cap has got Cabinet approval, is around the whole area of national research ethics, which is, is definitely a kind of systemic impediment uh, in the system, and which is the Department uh, with ourselves are, are potentially uh, going to have um, deliver solutions for. Uh, similarly, in the whole area of GDPR, there was a, a certain risk there that um, they were going that that um, GDPR regulations were going to get in, in the way of research going forward. The Health Research Re um, Regulations Bill is a mechanism by which Ireland will be a, a very high quality location to, to, to do research in a data sense. That said, we have absolute, you know, huge numbers of asks on our budget and CTI is only a component of that. So um, I would point out that to, to up, we are maintaining the line of 10% of our budget currently um, um, being dedicated to, to, to Cancer Trials Ireland and 20% across um, cancer, cancer research in general. So uh, we work in a very active way with the department uh, pushing particular um, priority areas and priority angles with us. Uh, and no doubt clinical research more broadly and clinical research facilities and infrastructure is one of the areas that we're in active discussion with them. Conscious you're a state body, but I mean, and I know you're dancing between uh, the lines, but it's quite obvious there's a degree of frustration. Um, from a budgetary point of view, you're being asked to make decisions, um, and obviously there's a lot of competing um, proposals put in front of you. Um, but from a CTI perspective, from an overall cancer perspective, like, it's quite obvious that there isn't enough funding. It's quite obvious that you're trying your best, but you'd be able to do an awful lot more with a little bit more funding. You'd be able to stretch it an awful lot more. Would that be fair to say? I think that's fair to say, but I would, I would point out that as a research funder, we make use of a very robust review process um, using that. international experts. So, you know, I'd I, I be kind of quite blunt in saying it's entirely possible that good causes uh, in terms of research ideas and concepts don't pass um, international peer review. And sometimes good ideas actually just quite, aren't quite good enough. So I think just, just be aware of that. It's, uh, in that sense, it's... Um, oh, yeah. What is the country? Yeah, there? well, I was actually going to go to you, next you? because I, I thought that would be the right place to go next. <laughs> Good man, that's great. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy. Um, just just in, that, in that context, um, you know, I, I think it's important to reflect on the fact that the Health Research Board is a research funder. It's also a state body, but has its own board. And yeah. the board made the decision to cut our fund in 20, you know, by 20 per cent, which you can, you can hear that the overall budget for the HRB was reduced. Mm -hmm. But the Health Research Board fund research, which is what the 45 people in Cancer Trials Ireland do. The least qualified person in our office has a Master's in Translational Oncology. It's not one bit intimidating. The, the revert, and these are the people that write protocols, that monitor safety, monitor quality and training, pharmacovigilance, all the, all the processes you need on a clinical trial for Irish patients to be safe and as I said in the opening statement that's expensive that's where the HRB should be focused around that's where the trials start that's where it's monitored that's where the research ideas from from people like Professor Hennessy come from at the hospital sites the employment of staff and research staff research nurses data managers if you look at any other country in the world that are doing this and doing this well Denmark is a country that's akin to us and I was talking to H uh, one of the, my colleagues in HRB CRCI yesterday they're recruiting four times the number of people onto cancer trials that we are because they've integrated the, the budget line item for research staff in cancer units is in the hospital and it's the same within the NHS we don't have a budget line item for research in the HSC, and, and, and we never have. So and you're saying that it's just, to encompass it, it's, it's, it's being ring-fenced, but it's not circulated through the whole network as regards an actual There's research no line. There's no budget ring-fenced for this. So I'm actually was in a site last week 
right? And they can't employ more research staff. They have one nurse and one data manager, and they're running trials with patients. They want to do more. There's, there's actually a gynaecology trial that's about to open, and they have no research nurse. And we, as a charity, are going to have to try and employ the nurse in the hospital. A charity. And that's happening all the way through the system. We, you know, universities are employing nurses within the system to do research. And at this point, it's just not good enough. And I think that's where, you know, I think Darren was politely trying to say this, but in terms of the Health Research Board, yes, they should fund research, but the activity at hospital sites is within the care. So access to a clinical trial isn't just a, a nice thing to do. This is about care for patients. This is the best option for patients. And, and I think Professor Hennessy is probably going to want to come in here, but if you want to attract more Professor Hennessy's into this country to do research and to work here, we're going to have to up our game in research because that's, that's when you get a better standard of care for the patient, but that's when you get the right people working in our centres. And that's a challenge at the moment, as, as you all know. It's a challenge to attract people to work in Irish hospitals right now. And I guarantee you, if you increase the investment in research in our hospitals, it'll happen. It's very revealing, Chair. Dr. Hennessy, or Professor Hennessy. Yeah, no, I, I just um, thank you, Deputy. I, I just go back and, and just stress again the point that international evidence tells us again and again that research active healthcare systems have better patient outcomes. And that's what we're, we're trying to. I mean, get to that level. Cancer, if, if we're to improve our cancer trials activity and to make cancer trials available to more patients, we really need two things. Number one, we need a research active healthcare system where the research activity is part and parcel of everything else that happens. In other words, we need So it's ingrained in the whole thing? It's ingrained. And it's not ingrained at the moment. The, the hospital. Silos. Yeah, it's exactly. It's an add-on. It's regarded as an add-on. The hospital units that I and others work in, we struggle day to day with, with, with where to fund our activity and our staff. We get much appreciated funding from the HRB, the Irish Cancer Society, but we have to go out and, and you know, get supplemental funding to do this from charities from our own activity I mean it's it, and it's not the way it should be we should have stability that the part of the core hospital infrastructure should be the cancer trials unit the nurses and doctors and research staff shouldn't be an add-on they shouldn't have to be hired through the research unit they should be an integral part of the hospital like any other doctor or nurse or physiotherapist or, or other hospital staff and they're not at the moment so the first piece we need to advance cancer trials activity is is that core hospital infrastructure piece which really is a, a responsibility of the Department of Health to make that happen and the second thing is is the like Darren said the direct funding for research which goes to our units to directly to research activity to trials and to our central office at Cancer Trials Ireland and, and that is, is where the HRB should be funding. They um, shouldn't have to support core hospital infrastructure. So we need the core hospital infrastructure and, and we do need more funding from the HRB directly to research both at our central office and in the, in the hospitals around the country. Um, and say, Avril Power just wanted to come in. Oh yeah, I was going to ask Avril a different question. Go on, yeah. Okay, I'm um, sorry, Deb. just, just yeah, to briefly add that research is a basic component of any modern day health service and it's a core aspect of the system and that's why it's called out in the National Cancer Strategy recommendation 47 says that the HSC will ensure that clinical cancer research and the staff who deliver it become a fully integrated component of cancer care delivery. Um, it shouldn't be down to charities like ourselves to fund basic components. So we provide, the Irish Cancer Society provides almost €500,000 a year to can Cancer Trials Ireland and much of that is core funding which in other countries would be provided by the health service. It shouldn't be for us to step up and have to fill that gap. We want to be able to fund research programmes themselves, not the basic infrastructure. Um, we also uniquely fund protected time for clinicians because one of the big issues um, for researchers in Ireland is that they don't have dedicated time as part of their contract for carrying out research. So if um, 
or if a medic working in our system wants to carry out research, wants to be part of a cancer trial, whether an Irish trial or an international cancer trial, they have to do it on top of their existing contract. So people who are already working insanely busy weeks under pressure to deliver basic clinical service, if they want to do cancer research, have to add on another 20, 30 hours a week from, from their own time to carry out that research. Um, and that's crazy and that's impossible and it's, it's unreasonable and it's the reason why healthcare professionals don't want to return here from other countries where that is a core aspect of their day job. It's all interconnected. Oh, I, ab absolutely, Deputy. Um, and that's why we need to have the investment in the infrastructure, we need to have CTI getting funding to, to fill those core activities so that they, we can dedicate charitable funding raised on Daffodil Day and through another initiative <coughs> to doing extra work, not yeah, filling yeah. the gap that the state should be providing and that any other decent health service would do. In fairness, the Chair is going to cut me off. So um, just yeah. one last question, um, and that's been very revealing. I think, Chair, for us as a committee, it's quite clear and obvious and up in flashing lights that we'll have to follow up with this with the department as regards to break it down into two simple things. Obviously, there's a funding issue, and I think, in fairness, Mr. Morrissey, you've been very diplomatic, but there's a funding issue. But also, there is an integrated process issue. There's a process issue across the whole spectrum um, when it comes to our health system as regards research, and uh, particularly it's been isolated here now in relation to cancer. And I think we should come back to this committee. Last thing, um, because I know Avril, and I didn't want to go without asking a question relating to your statement, which is fairly frank and direct, which is what I always expect. But um, I was very much, I, I'm not going to read it, but I was very much taken by where you talk about um, uh, underfunding and underperformance are two steps back. And you're, you're, you speak about, by the end of 2018, the, the various different stats. But specifically, you said even worse, the HSE's 2019 service plan explicitly states that the NCCP allocation this year will not enable the service to match referral demands in areas such as radiotherapy, rapid access clinics, and diagnostics. Um, could you elaborate on that? Um, <coughs> Specifically because, obviously, this is deeply, deeply concerning. I was aware of this, but if you could elaborate just based on scale, are there geographical issues? Are there other issues uh, regarding this that we need to know about? I mean, what, what, how, how deep uh, statistically and how deep uh, information have you in relation to that? Okay, Kelly, um, April, um, just conscious of time, we have another yeah. session starting hopefully at 12 o'clock, so if you could keep your okay. answer concise. Okay. Um, well, Deputy, the NCCP allocation for 2019 is an increase on last year, no but as already outlined, the number of Irish people getting cancer is rising at such a rate that we need to invest a lot more just to stand still, just to provide existing services. We have completely unacceptable waiting lists for screening, for diagnostic tests, for treatment, surgeries, radiotherapy, um, for existing services in those areas, let alone fulfilling the commitments in the National Cancer Strategy. So that's why we're calling for more to be given to the NCCP. There are excellent professionals working in the NCCP who would like to do more in cancer, but they can only work within the budget that they've been given by government, and it's quite simply, it's not enough, and patients are suffering as a result. Anything deeper statistically? Thank you. Um, we can there, I mean, the waiting times for tests vary from hospital to hospital. If you could provide um, us with any statistics you can, think would be useful, geographical coverage, all of that sort of stuff would be... Yeah, we uh, can, we'll yeah, come back to the deputy. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Kelly. Senator Burke. Yeah, um, thank you very much, and thank you all for your presentations here this morning. Um, and I think it's important that we do a review on this very important issue. Um, and I just want to open with... Um, the issue raised, I think, by Dr. Marcy in relation to the need for um, a coordinated structure or a coordinated group in relation to this whole area. How do you see that? Like, who do you believe is responsible for developing that? And how do you believe it should be set up and within what kind of time scale? Well, to, to, to be direct, I mean, the NCCP are, are charged with setting it up, and that's something that I know um, Jerome will be speaking about later on. Um, in, in terms of the time frame, it's, it's, it's now. <laughs> it needs to be set up now and with a broad cross-section of stakeholders. Uh, and I think at times, I think the word was used um, by, by, by Deputy Kelly, interconnected. Um, it is an interconnected system, therefore there is a, a, a wide range of stakeholders required. 
Um, certainly, the, the Department of Health is, is four square and central in it, uh, as is the, the NCCP and HSE. But for all funders, so in, in our submission, we, we would have um, uh, outlined some data whereby we assessed funding across all funders in the health space and also trickling through to cancer. So where, whereas we are the biggest in cancer, the Health Research Board, Science Foundation Ireland, the Irish Research Council and others have, have, have stakes in the game as well. And then the charity sector for sure need to be involved. We didn't mention it, however I think it, it, it's arguable that there could even be a role for industry at the table um, because clearly the whole system as it develops is going to be, need to be in an enabling environment for industry players to come in and do more clinical, act, clinical trial activity. Um, so, so I think they, they need to be involved as well. But most critical of all, and it's something we put in our submission, is the involvement of patients, not just through the representative groups, but actually directly, and the involvement in patients and, 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 um, and, and members of the public involved. And we propose um, a mechanism um, which, which is used by the, the James, James Lind Alliance, which is a mechanism uh, for research prioritisation in, uh, in the context of partnership. And that's something that, again, we, we, uh, we, we throw out as a potential uh, avenue that could be explored. It would involve a certain amount of investment because the broad, of the broad stakeholder group. But there are other methodologies as well. But in terms of timelines, I would think now, and, and certainly we've been engaging uh, directly even in, in recent weeks and months about getting this group set up. And, and could you see it actually being established within the next six months? Do you think it's feasible to have it established within the next six months? I, I think so. Okay. Maybe, Chair, sure, we might mark that down for review in six months just to, to try and set a timeline to try and get it set up. The second issue I wanted to raise, and uh, since this meeting started, I've got a number of texts from people who are involved in research who seem for some reason or other frustrated by the way the system operates. And I'm just wondering, you know, is there a situation where fe people are feeling themselves left out of the whole structure of research? Um, and is there a particular reason why any one group of people feel left out uh, who are working in the hospital structure but feel they can't get in uh, and get the, um, get the support for the research that they want to do. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you have come across that at this stage. Absolutely. I mean, if, 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 even at the level of the individual hospitals and the management, I think a lot of that may reflect recognition and support from the management of the existing hospitals because, like Evelyn said, it's, it's not a line item in the Department of Health's priorities or budget um, is research. So, and in trying to put together um, cancer research units in the hospitals, we all face that struggle. Um, we have to do it ourselves. We have to find our own budget in, you know, on top of what we get from the HRB and the Irish Cancer Society. We have to invest our own time, like Averill said, because we don't have protected time for research. So we have to do those extra hours on top of our, you know, on, on top of the primary responsibilities um, without protected time for research. That's all frustrating, um, and 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 that's that fundamentally reflects the fact that. Um, research is not an integral part of our healthcare system at the moment. So it's not, I suppose, an integral part of the priorities that are recognised by the management of the different hospitals. Um, and it needs to be. Yeah, but, if, but is it a situation that medical professionals who want to do this in their own time within the hospital structure are being restricted from doing it, even though they're doing it in their own time, are restricted from doing it? Yeah, I, th I would say that's, would you, Brian? Yeah, I mean, in the hospital? like, I, I suppose they're not being actively restricted from, from doing it, but they're being restricted from doing it in the sense that there is no support from management at the moment because it's not recognised as an integral part of the healthcare system. And they're being restricted from doing it because of other commitments without a protected time for research. So it's, when you've got a, a busy clinical load, and, and that's... You, that's that's you know that's all that you can really do in terms of the the, the 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 position you're in without a protected time for research. Then, I mean, there's indirect um, that that's an indirect block on developing a research 
program or research portfolio in a hospital because you need time, you need proper protective time um, to do that. You need recognition and support from the hospital management which needs to come down from, from uh, um, the Department of Health really um, where you know, research needs to be an integral part of the healthcare system. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Morrissey, you want to come in? Yeah. Um, I suppose just... That's okay. <laughs> from from a res research funder's perspective, um, I think it's really important to say that we're open to everyone, uh, you know, with qualifications to come in and, and, and we, we run programmatic calls, so, so in that sense no one should feel excluded. What we also do though with the likes of Cancer Trials Ireland and other uh, clinical, uh, clinic, clinical trial networks, we try to um, put funding into the system to allow the best people to come together to deliver you know, the right numbers of patients and to, to, with the right specialty skills. So there's no doubt it's incumbent on those networks to, to ensure that you know, the, the net is, is cast very wide and that there are no impediments, you know, infrastructural or, 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 or whatever. As it happens um, with Cancer Trials Ireland, we, we ran an international review last year, um, which was a positive review in terms of outputs, scientific outputs, but it did ask questions around the appropriate structures and how financial flow happens through the system, particularly in the context, again, of uh, this interconnectedness between trial activity and it having to happen in hospitals where of course there's change going on around you, you know I'm going to, I'm going to say Sean to care and regional integrated care organizations and whatnot so off the back of that recommendation to look at the structure we're running a, a more finance oriented and more structural oriented review um, which we're bringing through our board actually in terms of reference in the next few weeks which is then going to happen over the the, the coming months to ensure that Cancer Trials Ireland structurally is, is fit, for, fit for the future and the future of a transforming healthcare system. Yeah. Just share one of the things I got prepared before. Sir, can I, can I bring in Ms. Sorry, Monroe Senator, first? Thank you. Senator Burke, I just wanted to come in on, on that. Um, I was actually going to say it earlier. I think it's crucial that Sláinte Care um, builds in a clinical research um, strategy within their, within their future planning. I don't believe it's there. Um, and I think it's, you know, that's crucial going forward. If we're going to integrate trial activity in hospitals, it needs to be in, within that document. And, with, and I just don't believe it's there. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that, that uh, Dr. Morrissey has brought that up. And, in the, and the reason that's important is you ask, are there any researchers, clinicians at hospital sites who are restricted from doing studies? There's no one standing in front of people saying, no, you can't run this trial. Sometimes there are, but mainly they're not. But what's happening is you, you could have a contract for a trial going to one CEO of one hospital and the exact same contract for a clinical trial going to another and one hospital won't sign it and the other will. And, and so that, that means that patients in the hospital where the contract isn't signed are, are taken out of the mix for access to the clinical trial. And that there isn't continuity of how how we approach simple things like contracts for trials and that needs to go at a very high level within the NCCP or within the HSE and that would solve some issues and, and I imagine some of the researchers you've heard from were talking about that. The other thing is you asked are, do people feel left out? We fund more trials in the system. 70% of the money we, we distribute to hospital sites doesn't come from the Irish Cancer Society or the Health Research Board or the HSE. It comes from the money we generate for our own trials. And that's funding staff at hospital sites. That's coming you know, from collaborative groups, from industry that are funded and are in investigator initiated studies. So absolutely, Dr. Marcy is correct. The industry should be involved in this conversation. But, but we're a funder, and we're not part of this newly established research group that's been set up. Yet yeah, we're funding more trials in cancer in the system. So I, I, you know, I can understand the, the rationale behind it, because we're a charity. But when you actually look at the figures, and we've looked at the figures, we know exactly how much it costs to run a trial and exactly how much we spend on every single one of the 130 trials we have in our books. And, and I, I just think it's, it's worth we, all of us reflecting on that. Thank you. Just, Senator, just, just one last one, question. Yeah, just, uh, I got a paper prepared by a library research, and I know it was only prepared in kind of 10 days, but just to do a comparison with other jurisdictions and about cancer research and it was interesting in Denmark um, the uh, number of um, new clinical trials in 2016 was 0.0049% uh, um, in proportion to population whereas in Ireland it's 0.020% uh, not, not, uh, so we're 50% we're under what 
Denmark, which is very similar um, to in population size to Ireland. I think it's one that we should know, and I think Denmark is one area where they seem to have a very much coordinated system. Uh, the other thing in that report, it produced that <clears throat> barriers to child participation are structural, clinical, attitudinal, and differ, uh, and differ according to demographic and social e socio-economic factors. And, and that was a report uh, produced um, back in 2016 in a research um, uh, project in, in, the, in the United States. But I think it's important that we try and coordinate what's going on and, if at all possible, try and double the kind of numbers. And certainly I think your contribution here this morning can help us to work towards that. Thank you very much, Senator Burke. <coughs> and I'm going to move on to Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I welcome our guests this morning on, on, on the very important subject, I acknowledge the importance of it. Uh, just a couple of questions. I, I, I have taken a particular interest over the years in, in uh, cancer research and stats in particular, because if you get the right statistical information, it gives you an idea as to where uh, you should be directing your, your, your attention. In recent times, uh, it's not possible to get that information by way of parliamentary questions. It used to be once upon a time, and now it's, we're, we're referred to the, the annual report. And the problem there is the annual report is an annual report. You don't get a weekly report, you don't get a, a, a bi-weekly report, you don't get any of those things. And I am going to, to engage with the Minister to try to change that because everything doesn't, uh, uh, um, is not necessarily, no disrespect to the people who compile the reports, but a report that's more than a year old uh, can lack uh, a certain amount of authenticity in terms of information. The question that I wanted to make the comparison, following on uh, Senator Brooks, the questions, in the countries that are similar to ours, who spend more m more on, 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 on cancer and cancer um, cancer research and, and diagnostics, etc., what about the outcomes? Have you made comparisons in relation to the outcomes uh, that you can give us, so that we know uh, what we should be doing in order to to, to achieve uh, similar outcomes? Are the outcomes they, they, they should be obviously better, but they may not be, and I don't know. So maybe maybe you can tell us. In relation to uh, the various forms of cancer, uh, the extent to which we can, as public representatives, get that information, and there are many, many forms now, and melanoma is a classical one that keeps coming up again and again and again, and um, uh, early diagnosis is hugely important, but we don't always be, again be able to get the information on a regional basis. Uh, I, I feel that it can be quite informative to be able to find out, you know, the incidence. Why are the, we've been told in the past, for instance, that it's 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 uh, it's uh, uh, better diagnostics, uh, greater healthcare, greater uh, emphasis on healthcare, whatever the case may be. But maybe you have uh, some information that may be of beneficial there. Uh, the educational element of of of, uh, of cancer prevention. I think we could do a bit more on that, and I, I would like to hear your comments on it uh, in relation to the various forms of cancer as well. And I, you know, there are, there, are, there are particular ones that come, up, come to mind in relation to um, the 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 uh, um, genetics. Uh, I, I would be interested, for instance, again. Uh, the extent to which you have identified um, the. Um, uh, genetic uh, tendency, uh, in, 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 and there appears to be fairly solid information in that. And again, the extent I know, and I'm aware of it, but I'd just like to, to hear more about it. The extent to which um, one can intervene at a crucial stage to try to turn that in favour of the patient. In relation to, I'm sorry, Chairman, for going on so long, but. Um, I can get an opportunity again. Uh, the, the, the other thing, I, you know, we fully appreciate, Chairman, that every every aspect of the health services are suffering for a, a lack of, of, of finance because of the downturn in the economy. We can't address that all in one go. We do find ourselves competing with. Um, and it's not easy, and this has been brought to our attention repeatedly uh, through, through the HSC, uh, is that the, in order to attract the right staff and the numbers that we require and to retain the, the right staff, we have to compete with Australia and America and Canada. And it's a difficult one. 
It's not an easy one, and we should all be aware of that. It's not an easy one for the, from the patient's point of view, because obviously a patient feels that they are entitled to the best possible treatment that's available as soon as it is available anywhere. And there has been quite an amount of trauma arising from the fact, and we know this, Chairman, from discussions here, that various uh, uh, um, um, treatments are not available for a whole variety of reasons. Maybe it's because we're too slow to react. Maybe it's because of lack of finance. Maybe it's for a variety of reasons that we need to address. And to what extent do you think we can address the most salient of those in, 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 in the shortest possible uh, term? And um, the last point I want to make is in relation to availability and access to research through the public sector and through the private sector, and to, 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 to inquire as to the degree to which you rely on uh, each of those two sectors uh, and, 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 and the, the return for, 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 from, from your, your, your uh, research point of view. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Do you mind if you bank those questions? And I, I want, in, in the interest of time, I just want to bring in uh, Deputy Brazel and Deputy Donnelly to complete their questions, and then we're, we're going to have to move on to our next section. So, um, Deputy Brazel. Thank you uh, for the opportunity, Chairman, and I want to welcome um, all the witnesses and, and thank them uh, most sincerely for the wonderful work that they all do uh, individually and collectively. Um, my, my specific area of interest is around um, new drugs and the availability um, onto the system. And my first question is, are you finding that the, uh, the, the slowness in which drugs are made available or reimbursed is, is now becoming a challenge to um, your strategy and trying to keep up with um, your targets from where, where we'd like to be at, at, you know, one of the, at the top end of dealing with our life-saving? Um, we went from 3 out of 10 survival to 6 out of 10. and. Um, specifically around the area now where, where, I mean, drugs are being developed to treat individual patients and, you know, if that's the way uh, the whole area is going, um, are we going to be left behind because of the methodology by which we use to, to reimburse um, drugs? And I'm just wondering, is there, is there a need to separate out oncology drugs from all other drugs? Because um, time is of the essence. You know, if you're dealing with somebody and you get them early and get them, you can save their lives. And if you don't, uh, then the, the inevitable consequence happens. Um, there, there is also, um, I just like your opinion on drugs that are life extending as opposed to life saving. And, um, you know, I would have a, a specific interest in, um, in, in lung, uh, treatment where, where we're, we're behind the curve, I think, and um, there's a drug, Tagriso, which is out there at the moment, reimbursed in 20 countries, not reimbursed in Ireland, and it has significant life-extending um, uh, capabilities for, for those on it. I'd just like to, to, hear, to hear your opinion on that. Um, and uh, lastly, I, I just ask, are, are, are reimbursement delays in effect a false economy for, for, for uh, our health system because of the inevitable cost that follows that somebody that enters into uh, end-of-life care. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Brazel. And Deputy Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I, you're all very welcome. Can I ask the, the Health Research Board, um, in terms of funding, what's the split between primary and applied research? Um, I've spoken to some of our scientists who uh, their view is that primary, funding for primary research, research was stripped out largely in the last, say, 10 years. Um, several of them have described, for example, how they might have been working on particular molecules, basic research that led to or could lead to all sorts of wonderful things. But they felt that research was stripped away and they felt they were essentially being outsourced to the pharmaceutical industry to uh, do testing on uh, their drugs and on the impacts of, of, of their drugs. How much, how much of the research is primary, as in it's not linked to any specific drug, any particular trial, it's core basic lab-based research in uh, 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 cancer research. Can I ask, 
Um, this is a question, I guess, both for yourselves and for Cancer Trials Ireland. All of the, the, the trials that are being funded, um, are any of the drugs publicly owned or co-owned or is all of the IP privately owned? And if all of the IP is privately owned, um, and this is essentially private companies trialling their own products, what percentage on average are the companies funding to trial their products versus uh, the state, or indeed third parties, um, for that? Um, for the Health Research Board, you, you've three very, your presentation is very useful, thank you. In terms of your recommendations, the first one is um, to establish the National Cancer Research Group to improve coordination. It sounds like something you'd all support. Can I ask what's the current status of that? On your second one, it's develop a culture in the cancer care system that values research, which struck me as bizarre. Because it, you said there's a, there's a lack of recognition within the healthcare system that research is relevant. That strikes me as peculiar as hearing from the university sector. These university professors don't, don't believe that research is relevant. I don't believe that, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't believe that our medics don't value research. I think they may be so overworked that they never get the time to do it and their incentives are misaligned. Could I just ask for your comment? Because the statement is there's a lack of recognition that research is relevant. That's not referring I, to medics. I'll be, well, within the research system, yeah. I, I'll be astounded if that's true. Yeah, maybe the question is, when you say within the healthcare system, are you including doctors in there? That's the, on, on your third recommendation, it's build patient and public trust by improving the use of cancer data. I read through this. This to me sounds like the sort of thing that, you know, a PhD student or a, Boffin or a team of boffins could knock together in about a week. I know I'm probably oversimplifying by a bit, <laughs> but honestly, you're talking about getting a bunch of existing data sets and doing clever things with the data. Um, is that not something that could just be knocked together very quickly? I know it's. I know you have to hire very clever people, but ultimately, it doesn't sound like very difficult uh, difficult work. Um, can I ask the answer, the Irish Cancer Society? I was really taken by saying that six of the seven targets for implementation have been missed. Um, why that is, what you think is going on, because we'll shortly be talking to some of the people whose job it is to implement those. Um, and you have a very stark sentence where you say, the HSE's 2019 service plan explicitly states that the National Cancer Control Programme allocation for this year will not enable the service to match referral demands. That's pretty terrifying if we're actually saying that in our own delivery program. Um, can I ask why you think that is? And the other question is, what do you think the biggest opportunity is? I know you've listed about seven or eight things you'd like to see, but if there was one thing that we could, we could sort, what, 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 would be the, um, what would be the most useful? And then the, the final question to Cancer Trials Ireland, is just, it, it's on the back of what uh, uh, Deputy Brazel was saying. Yes, we need to fund cancer trials. My, I don't know, but my guess is the per patient cost is a lot more expensive than providing them with, you know, approved drugs. Could you give us a sense, and I know there's wildly different costs, but basically, how many, how many patients could you treat with existing drugs for every patient on a, on a trial? I know it's a huge range, but on average. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Now, there's a lot of questions banked up there, so we might just if you can deal with as many of them as you can um, from, from each of the three speakers before we move on. So maybe John, could, could, um, uh, Professor Hennessy. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. I just want, want to address the one initially that I think is key to these discussions. That's the value of research in the healthcare system that you've talked about because that relates and relates back to the idea of creating core infrastructure in the hospitals for cancer trials for clinical research. It's not a, vac a lack of value for research by, by medics, doctors, nurses or any of that. It's the fact in the system from the Department of Health down that there isn't a recognition that research sh should be an integral part. And what I mean by that is a hospital manager will have a ward 
and that ward needs, say, 10 nurses, and it's part of his job or her job to get 10 nurses for that ward. There is no, I, no recognition of cancer research in that way. There is no budget line item in, in a hospital management or Department of Health that says the cancer trials unit in that hospital needs 10 staff members. We need to hire them. So that, that while the, the, the management of hospitals will staff the wards, they will not staff the cancer trials unit at the moment because it's not recognised as an integral part of the system. So we, us, doctors and nurses in the research system have to go out and staff our own cancer trials unit with our own monies from HRB, Irish Cancer Society, Cancer Trials Ireland, charities, our own you know, donations from patients and so on. So when we talk about value for research in the healthcare system, we need the Department of Health, the NCCP, the HSC and the hospital management to recognise the Cancer Trials Unit as an integral part of the hospital as much uh, so as any ward in that hospital and to be staffed accordingly. Ms. Monroe. Yeah. I think that describes the passion that exists in the system from the members of Cancer Trials Ireland who are the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, the haematologists, the, the cancer research nurses are looking and dealing and working with patients every day and those patients are looking at them for other options and they don't turn their back on them. This, this organisation started 20 years ago to provide an opportunity for Irish patients with cancer to have another option and you know, um, I know uh, Deputy Donnelly you asked about you know, the IP and, and the costs around that. We did a, an economic and health impact analysis and we commissioned DKM to do it to, in 2016 and we were able to prove that there was cost savings of 6 million in 2016 in drug costs. That was for drug costs that would have otherwise been available within the system. So you're talking about how much more is it to put a patient on a trial than to not. It's actually cheaper to put a patient on a trial for the system. That's very crude terms. And we can prove that. And then the health impact takes it a step further because that patient then gets quality adjusted life years, what we call qualities in health economics. And we've been able to prove that many Irish patients, hundreds, thousands of Irish patients, have had years of qualities. That's one quality is one perfect year of life. And many have got five to ten. And that's one of the reasons trials are so successful now, because they are running longer. Why? Because patients are surviving for longer. So, so just on your point around, around the economic impact, there's a very real one. And I think you know, it's, it's probably you know, going to increase over time. And I think, you know, Deputy Brazel, you talked about you know, access and innovative treatments. We're not in the business of, of health economics, that's not what we do, we, we run trials and the drugs that we're working with are experimental, <coughs> mostly. But very often with experimental drugs, and, and Professor Hennessy um, can, can jump in here, you're comparing standard of care treatments with an investigational product. So when that happens, and when, say for example, if it's a pharmaceutical sponsored trial, or if it's one of our investigator initiated trials, that drug is covered. The cost of those drugs on both arms of the trial are covered. So, but but in, in terms of the access piece, sure that's going to be an issue and I think the Irish Cancer Society are probably going to jump in on that. But in the absence of that, and I've talked about it earlier, we have a patient here who benefited from being on a trial on a drug that wasn't available in the system. You up the game in clinical trials, you offer more options to Irish patients. They live longer as well. Dr. Hen Dr. Morrissey. Um, so, a number of questions. Try, I'll try and be rapid. I'll poke fire on these. Um, so, firstly, just with Deputy Durkin, uh, in the context of education, I thought that was a really good question. Um, it's a very important education of the population and the healthcare professional community as well on the importance of, of prevention. So we, just as an example, co-fund uh, in collaboration with the National Cancer Institute in the US a series of fellowships in cancer pre prevention and then also courses where medics um, and uh, allied healthcare professionals can go and attend courses in, in Bethesda. Um, you know, hun hundreds of those courses have been taken up, so these are the things that we engage in which are, which are important. Deputy Donnelly, um, the, the, the first question of, um, you, you use the term pri primary research, the term we would use is basic biomedical research and, and where that fits within the HR, HRB brief. Um, there is no doubt to say, but to say that during the, what I'm going to call euphemistically the austerity years, the focus for Department of Health definitely um, and, and HRB shifted towards the more applied end of research. That is, that is a, a matter of fact. Uh, we've moved 
increasingly away from funding basic research. However, there is still a, a place in our portfolio for basic biomedical research. Currently, over 35 million uh, or thereabouts um, um, revenue stream, about 2 million of it is, is dedicated to basic biomedical. Now, that's across all disease areas, not for cancer necessarily. We would have to go and have a look at the specific cancer uh, data for that. I know, we are, I know you're trying to stop us talking. Just, just one point on that. Look, yeah. you, you live and breathe this stuff. You understand it better than I ever will. There's a concern that's been raised with me by numerous scientists independently of each yeah. other over the past few years. Yeah. And your answer is frank. It's the most frank answer I've had, actually, so thank you for that. The concern they're raising is that you have to have a pipeline the whole time. And there's this balanced technology readiness pipeline. There's all these different ways of looking at it. Numerous scientists have said to me over the years that because of this shift away from mm. basic research, that that we're 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 starving the pipeline for the future. Mm. And we're, we can still live on development and innovation mm. of basic research done 20, 30 years ago, but that ultimately it's it's going to catch up with us just for what it's worth. Yeah, and look, I, I personally have sympathy, and and what I would what what I believe is we've used the term interconnectedness. There are other funders in the system, and we do need to approach this in a kind of a national funding mechanism um, uh, way. Innovation 2020, the national research strategy, calls out a place for basic um, research funding. My own view is that they're, and, and actually it looks like they're moving this location in, in this way as the Science Foundation Ireland will play a bigger role here. Now that, that, that remains to be seen in terms of the quantum, but I think certainly engagement between ourselves as a, as a, a more applied health research funder and other funders to allow to um, a, a basic uh, funding uh, pot to flourish. So we engage with the likes of the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and we'd co-fund with them and pull actually leverage funding into the state from from um, from welcome in the basic space. We do the same with um, the National Inf uh, Institute of Health in the U.S. and NIH and others. So it, there there is one po point I did want to address, but probably loads actually. But I know we're running out of time. Just in the in, in the context of um, of, of data. <coughs> Uh, it's, it's, it is more complex, I suppose, than, than you've outlined. Uh, that that recommendation is really founded on the issues that, that abound, whatever jurisdiction you're in now, in the context of data governance, mining people's data, data protection. So uh, when we talk about linkage, it's not an easy thing to do. And in fact, there's quite invest, a lot of investment has come in from different countries, most notably actually by, by Northern Ireland, uh, in that particular space, to set up um, what they call safe, safe havens for data um, uh, linkage, um, using principles that the CSO would know a lot about. We wrote a particular paper in 2016, which we call the Dazzle Report. We actually have more of these, so we're very happy to hand these out. M making a proposal which the Department of Health are actually quite minded to, um, to, to, to run with. So it's more complex, but we do believe um, there, there's a, a solution there. And one last point. I do apologise. Again, Deputy uh, Donnelly, just on the, on the subject of IP ownership, um, all funders in Ireland sign up to the National IP Management Protocol. So within that, I mean, the, 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 the simple answer to, to, to your question about what percentage flows through each project is that it depends on the project and it depends the skin on the game that the industry partner or private sector partner might put in. And the rules are laid out as per the national IP framework, which again is linked to state aid and, and, and European legislation. So that's a kind of a simple answer to it, 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 it depends. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I really have to clarify, so, Cancer Trials Ireland is a charity, we have no IP um, and a lot of, I can talk to you again about patient organisations and, and who have run and led their own research, you're not able to. Thank you. Yeah. And finally. Thank you Chairman. Um, there Thank you. have been a number of questions, I'll briefly answer some and then my colleague um, Donna will answer the rest. Um, Deputy Brazel asked about access to medicines and there's no doubt that there's huge potential for personalised medicines to massively transform patient experiences and outcomes. Um, and it's particularly stressful for patients, especially those with a terminal diagnosis, to know that there is a new medicine um, that could 
either save or extend their, their life and that they can't get access to it, particularly if, for example, that same medicine is available across the water to the NHS. Um, so it's, it's a big issue and it's a growing issue. Um, and I think patients feel like they're caught in the middle um, between government and industry on this one. The process, um, the NCCP part of the process, the National Centre for Pharma Economics has quite a transparent process that looks at the data um, and interrogates the proposition being put forward by pharma. But then after that, after they've made a recommendation, it goes into the department, goes into the political system and there's a black hole there in terms of what happens to it. And there's a sense among patients that it's a very political decision. Um, and that there isn't fairness there and it's about who, who shouts the most or who can, um, you know, and that is again is, is particularly stress, distressing for patients because what we need is a system that's fair, that's based on data um, where a patient can be confident that if their doctor believes that their particular type of cancer will respond to a new medication that they can get access to it. Um, you know, these medicines are expensive, they don't work for everybody and again that's an issue that we need to educate patients on more because sometimes patients read to the media about so-called miracle drugs and they think because it has worked for one patient with their type of cancer that it will work for them and unfortunately not. Um, but where the, where the data is strong enough and the NCP is satisfied that there is a clinical um, and pharmacological, uh, economical benefit to providing that medicine, it should be provided. Um, and that, that is a big issue. Or do you have figures on how we compare to EU average as, as time the time of reimbursement of, of new drugs? Yeah, again, so we... You could yeah, forward it to me, maybe? Yeah, we can. You, yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely. Um, then on the other issue of um, Deputy Donnelly asked what the biggest opportunity I guess this was the one thing we could do that would make the biggest difference. I think in the medium to long term it would be cancer prevention because four out of ten cancers are preventable through things like the HPV vaccination um, and through lifestyle changes. We each have it within our, our power and we have it in our power as a society to make sure that cancer numbers don't double over the next 25 years as they're predicted to do. So I think that would, that would be, make a massive difference. In the short term it would be early diagnosis. Um, a frightening number of Irish patients are diagnosed in emergency departments, 3,000 patients every year. Um, the most, the three quarters of those are at a late stage when their cancer is difficult if not impossible to treat. Um, and there is no doubt that thousands of lives could be saved if people were diagnosed earlier, if we tackle those issues around waiting lists. Uh, uh, we, we really are going to have to move on because... I, I am aware of that, Chair, but I've been here since 9 o'clock this morning, don't forget that. <coughs> uh, I, I, a comparison in relation to those who have uh, had the benefit of early, <coughs> early diagnosis as compared with those who haven't. Have you any stats on those? Yes, yeah, so um, if you look at, for example, say testicular cancer, um, if you're caught at an early stage, 19 out of 20 patients will survive. At late stage, um, only 1 in 10 will. So the difference is massive. Right? The, the greatest way to save lives in cancer is to diagnose people early when their treatment options are much wider and their chances of survival are greater. Um, and unfortunately for far too many patients, that isn't happening and lives are being lost as a result. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, on behalf of the committee... Um, Sorry, my colleague just want very briefly to add oh, something just on um, Deputy Durkin's so question. I, I just wanted to address your, your question in relation to outcomes for cancer in, in, in particular. I, I think if you consider where we were back when we first organised cancer uh, into 10-year strategies back in 1996, outcomes for cancer in Ireland were the worst in Western Europe. Over the last 20 years, we've got to mid-table and that's by implementing ambitious cancer strategies. So it shows that the cancer strategy 10-year process works. Um, in comparison to other international uh, countries, the likes of Dor Denmark, Norway, Austria, have better outcomes for cancer than us. We can, through the implementation of this strategy over the next 10 years, achieve the target of getting from mid-table to the top quartile of cancer outcomes in, in Europe. So that's the prize that is there should we choose to, which I believe we should, invest in this particular cancer strategy, the research, the services, the coordination, the networks that are required to deliver world-class cancer care. 
The other point you, you raised was in relation to genetics. Um, genetics uh, and, and genetic services are a challenge. We don't have the funding uh, available to support comprehensive genetic services. I, I am aware of, of, of services in uh, St James's Hospital that were suspended uh, at a point last year because the symptomatic uh, numbers coming through overwhelmed that system. There is also, you know, we have leadership there, but we need to put funding behind that leadership. And indeed, there is also the issue when you are, you know, you are brought through those genetic services. Um, can you get the preventative surgery? So, if you require preventative surgery, can you get access to it because it's considered elective at times? The final thing you asked around education on cancer prevention, that cancer prevention has been one of the uh, areas of progress in relation to this strategy and the development of a cancer prevention network within the NCCP and a cancer prevention function. That is vital because four in ten cancers, as Avril mentioned, are preventable. So over the course of this strategy, more than 100,000 people will get a cancer which is preventable through changes in lifestyle. Um, unfortunately, the changes that we made make now, we won't see for 20, 30 years, but unless we do it now, we will have the doubling of cancers by 2045, which are predicted. Thank you very much. You. It, this is a subject, obviously, that we could speak about all day. Many of the witnesses want to continue speaking. Unfortunately, we have another set of witnesses to come in, and we have a time limit on the room here. So, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you most sincerely. Uh, Professor Hennessy and Evelyn Munro uh, from Cancer Trials Ireland, Avram Power and Donald Buggy from the Irish Cancer Society, and Dr Morrissey and Maria Dodrisco from the Health Research Board. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We're going to suspend for a moment to allow our next set of witnesses to take their seats. Thank you.
to continue to uh, look at the National Cancer Strategy. And <clears throat> our next group of witnesses are uh, Dr. Anna Therese, Head of Research and Development at the HSE, Dr. Jerome Coffey, National Cancer Control Program, HSE, Mr. Michael Conroy, Principal Officer, Cancer Policy Unit, Department of Health, Ms. Judith Corcoran, Assistant Principal, Cancer Policy Unit, Department of Health, and Ms. Theresa Maguire, Head of Research Services at the Department of Health. Thank you very much for coming this morning and sorry for keeping you. I wish to draw your attention to the fact uh, that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made <clears throat> to the committee may be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Thank you. Can I now ask Mr Conroy to make your opening statement? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to attend this morning for your examination of the National Cancer Strategy 2017-2026. I am joined by Dr. Theresa Maguire, Head of Research Services Unit, Department of Health, and by Judith Corcoran of the Cancer Policy Unit. The National Cancer Strategy is a comprehensive policy document that aims to meet the needs of cancer patients in Ireland for a 10-year period. This is the third National Cancer Strategy and it builds on the history of strong policy in cancer over the past 20 years. The main achievements of the 2006 strategy include provision of equal access to quality treatment, the establishment of designated cancer centres, multidisciplinary management as a standard of care for patient, cancer patients, the centralisation of some cancer surgery services, rapid access clinics for breast, lung and prostate cancer, significant increases in access to medical oncology and cancer drug treatment, a national programme for radiation oncology and cancer screening on a nationwide basis through breast check, cervical check and bowel screen. The establishment of the National Cancer Control Programme, the NCCP, to implement the strategy recommendations followed in 2007. The National Cancer Strategy 2017-2026 is aligned with Slauncha Care and its implementation is a key part of the Slauncha Care Action Plan. The vision of the strategy is, together we will strive to prevent cancer and work to improve the treatment, health and well-being, experiences and outcomes of those living with and beyond cancer. We developed the strategy in collaboration with clinicians, nurses, health and social care personnel, patients, carers and organisations such as the Health Research Board and the Irish Cancer Society. The strategy sets out four goals that are crucial to the achievement of the vision. Reduce the cancer burden, provide optimal care, maximise patient involvement and quality of life and enable and assure change. In relation to reducing the, bur the, the cancer burden, cancer prevention is a cornerstone of the strategy. The proportion of cancer incidents attributable to modifiable lifestyle and environmental factors is estimated to be in the 30 to 40 percent range. Of these risk factors, smoking has by far the biggest impact, and in implementing this strategy, we are working towards the goal of making Ireland tobacco-free by 2025 including through the enactment of legislation on standardised retail packaging for tobacco. We also need to maintain our efforts to reduce the number of avoidable cancers through the promotion of healthy lifestyles in areas such as improved diet, more exercise and reduced alcohol intake. We are focused on diagnosing cancer at the earliest possible stage as a critical step in reducing the mortality and in improving survival and quality of life. Public and health professional awareness of warning signs for cancer is vital. Early presentation is key, as is ensuring that people take up the offer of cancer screening. 
Moving to optimal care, the primary aim for all cancer services is to provide evidence-based care that is effective, safe, of high quality and patient-centred. The concept of a continuum of care will underpin the approach to patient services, from prevention, early diagnosis and evidence-based quality patient-centred treatment to appropriate follow-up and support. Multidisciplinary team working has led to better decision making, more coordinated patient care and improvements in the overall quality of care. It is proposed that all patients diagnosed with cancer will have their case formally discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. This strategy is building on the progress made to date through supporting the key role of designated cancer centres in cancer treatment. The centralisation of surgical services for more cancers is being progressed and radiation oncology and medical oncology will continue to be improved and expanded. A report in January this year from the National Cancer Registry confirmed that the programme of centralisation of cancer services is contributing to ongoing improvements in cancer survival. Also, the Concord programme established global surveillance of cancer survival as a metric of the effectiveness of health systems. The most recent programme data from 2014 indicates that in Ireland survival has increased for all tumour type studies. Our aim now is that survival rates in Ireland will reach the top quartile of European countries by the end of the strategy period. Patient involvement is a key aspect of the strategy. We now have an increasing number of cancer survivors with their perspectives to offer on the development of services for cancer patients. Building on the significant impact of the Cancer Patient Forum in developing this strategy, a Cancer Patient Advisory Committee is now in place, and patient involvement in policy making and in the delivery of services is being promoted in the implementation of the strategy. With many people living significantly beyond cancer diagnosis and treatment, there is a need to develop and implement survivorship programmes. This has consistently been a key concern of patient representatives, whose focus is on quality of life. These programmes will emphasise physical, psychological and social factors that affect health and well-being, while being adaptable to people with more specific survivorship needs following their treatment. The NCCP provides leadership across the continuum of cancer care. It promotes the vision of high-quality evidence-based care to optimise outcomes and patient experience. The NCCP has been instrumental in reforming and improving how services have been delivered. Under this strategy, the NCCP is working closely with hospital groups and community health care organisations to lead service reorganisation and to ensure that integrated care pathways are provided for those affected by cancer. The focus is on ensuring that the objectives of the strategy will continue to underpin decisions on cancer care across the health services. The strategy emphasises the positive impact of research activity on patient care. The development of a culture in cancer care system in the cancer care in the cancer care system that values research to the benefit of patients is the aim of the strategy. The data collected and managed by the National Cancer Registry is a foundation for research activity to drive improvements in cancer care for patients. Cancer Research also supports the recruitment, retention and motivation of excellent clinical staff that drive the development of high quality, efficient services. The first National Cancer, Cancer Strategy 2017-2016 implementation report for 2018 was published by the Minister on the 4th of February. The report focuses on the implementation of the 52 recommendations. Highlights include legislation on standardised retail packaging for tobacco, the passage of the Public Health Alcohol Act 2018, progress towards a national skin cancer prevention plan, new posts in medical and surgical oncology, capital developments in relation to radiation oncology, publication of a model of care for oral anti-cancer medications, the commencement of the rollout of a national cancer information system, the progress being made by the working groups on survivorship and psycho-oncology and the establishment of a cancer patient advisory committee. The department and the NCCP are working together to ensure that progress is maintained in the implementation of the strategy. We hold monthly performance overview meetings as well as quarterly review meetings specifically focused on reviewing progress on the implementation of the strategy recommendations. The strategy was formulated with the input of all stakeholders, stakeholders and it enjoys broad support. 
The Department and the NCCP are committed to working with these stakeholders to progress its implementation so that many people will avoid cancer in the coming years and those with cancer will receive comprehensive quality treatment and will maximise their quality of life following their treatment. Thank you. Mr Conway, thank you very much. Can I now ask Dr Jerome Coffey from the Cancer Control Programme to make an opening statement? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee, committee officers. Thank you for the invitation today. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Anna Therese, HC Head of Research and Evidence. We've already submitted two presentations to the committee, so in this uh, briefer opening statement, we'd like to focus on the development of cancer services in Ireland over the term of the National Cancer Strategy to 2026 and the roles of the NCP of the HSE's research and evidence programme in this. Uh, it, back in May 2015, the steering group and patient form charged with developing the third National Cancer Strategy were established, and working on this, it became clear how much had changed in cancer services since publication of the previous strategy in 2006. The programmatic approach and the national scale of organisation investment have been commended by an international external evaluation panel and are in, in alignment with the EU cancer control principles. Recommendations in the strategy are also consistent with, the, with a, a number of areas in the Slaunch Care Report published by the Commission on the Future of Healthcare in May of 2017, and these are citizen engagement and empowerment, integration of care and meeting population needs, service design and care pathways, infrastructure e-health and quality of care. Um, as is clear in the implementation report for 2018 published by the Department last month, there has been considerable progress to date. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that clinical leaders have been appointed in cancer nursing, psycho-oncology and for children and adolescents, young adults with cancer. In the area of cancer research, there is broad agreement, as described earlier this morning in this chamber, that research, uh, that fun permanent funding for core research staff is essential, uh, with the HC framework of support and research governance, which will enable the growth of clinical research and facilitate collaboration with both industry and the academic centre. In developing the strategy and in the initial phase of its implementation, it's all about collaboration between the relevant elements of the healthcare system with the registered charities, greatly enhanced by increasing levels of public and patient involvement. So in closing, I'd like to, we'd like to reiterate the importance of the National Cancer Strategy as an appropriately ambitious plan for the further development of cancer prevention and patient care, and look forward to your ongoing support for this work. Thank you. Dr. Coffey, thank you very much. So now we are going to commence our questioning, and our first contributor is Deputy Stephen Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you all very much, and for your um, your detailed presentations. I think I printed out about 200 pages uh, over the last day or two. Um, can I ask, first of all, um, for the, the 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 department officials um, in terms of cancer policy for the state? What are the biggest opportunities over the next, say, one to five years, in terms of Reducing, reducing prevalence. I suppose the single biggest opportunity area is prevention, because we have, uh, I know, um, I think it was Averill quoted a figure of 40%. There's various figures, but it's towards 40%. Certainly, over 30%, and towards 40% of cancers are preventable. And uh, we have very distinct policies for cancer developed since starting in 1996, but particularly. We were at uh, internationally at a very uh, uh, below the curve, I suppose, in 1996. We've been gradually coming up to mid-table and so on. So, in um, in moving forward, it's really building on the successes we've had in the past. We have um, a lot of emphasis on prevention in the first uh, year and a half now of implementation of the strategy. Uh, we uh, are going about that in a very integrated way with Healthy Ireland. It's uh, uh, part of the overall prevention message of the department and a lot of the messages around protecting people from cancer are the same messages from protecting people from other illnesses. Um, on survivorship then, there's a uh, in, uh, because of uh, the successes in, in, in some respects of the, the treatment that we've had had over the last 10 years and so on, we have an ever-increasing number of people living with and beyond cancer is the term we use. So from diagnosis to people who have had cancer and now, are now out of cancer or uh, are surviving cancer and living well beyond cancer in many cases. So you have 170,000 people in that category. In that category, often when people come out of treatment, and I could talk about developments in treatment, but let's just focus on this for a second. In, um, in our discussions around the development of strategy, I particularly remember a patient who talked about looking forward to coming out of treatment and we told you you're now clear of cancer and when she actually got to that day, instead of having a feeling of euphoria, she talked about having a feeling of fear around uh, 
you know, losing a comfort blanket and what do you do now? Yeah. And structures, a lot of structures are needed around that. Okay. And that's something we're working very closely with patients on. And it's something that we work hand in hand with, you know, across Thanks. the voluntary sector. Can and I so ask on. Mr. Conroy just on, on prevention? Um, it, it's said to me reasonably regularly that Ireland is poor at, at public health investment. There's some things we do spectacularly well in healthcare, but that on a, on a comparative basis, say relative to OECD or EU countries, that our investment and activity in public health and in prevention is, is pretty low. W would you agree with that or, or not? Well, I don't know what the relevant figures are. I mean, it depends what country you take, but I mean, well, certainly... Say at, at an OECD or EU um, level. Uh, Theresa might want to, or, or uh, Can I make a point to that? Yeah. This, this country has a good record and it comes from legislation that is world class and they're ahead of the rest of the world in tobacco control, sunbed use and public health alcohol bills. So that's legislation. That is the work of the public health community supporting the department policy and the legislation that comes through. So I think we are ahead of the game and many parts of the world in that area. Okay, and in terms of our, our investment as a percentage of our healthcare budget, I, I could be wrong, but people keep telling me that we're, we're low in percentage in absolute terms in terms of the prevention bit, which seems to be the big, both your, you, yourself and the previous um, witnesses were saying that's the, the biggest opportunity. Is there a big opportunity to increase focus uh, and effectiveness and funding into prevention public health measures? I would say that prevention isn't a high cost initiative and I get, it gets appropriate prioritisation in the cancer strategy. In the cancer control programme we've, we've got four public health uh, specialists contributing to Healthy Ireland but also developing and uh, establishing the Irish Cancer Prevention Network and again it is a question of organisation looking at the evidence and implementing it. It is not about finding huge amounts of budget to make a change. Okay, thank you. Um, similarly, one of the, the, the issues that was raised was early detection and that we, there's a big opportunity for us to get better at that. Do, do you have a, a, a plan for that? Do you agree with that, first of all? Do you have a plan? And what are the big opportunities in terms of yeah. earlier detection? There are a number of answers to the question, but uh, just break it down a little bit. One is awareness, and I think the cr credit is due to uh, cancer Society and other charities that have done awareness campaigns, say for lung cancer, these symptoms meet lung cancer until proven otherwise, get to a GP, get your chest x-ray. So we are working towards that with uh, longer, more sustained public awareness campaigns and also working with the education system. Um, the other bit about early diagnosis came up in the previous session, I just looked up the numbers. The last number we have is for presentation of patients for the first time with their cancer to an emergency department is about 13% the metric in the strategy is to reduce that by half over the lifetime of the strategy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a, a local issue, though uh, it's not from my locality. Um, Sligo, uh, obviously back in whatever it was, 06 I think it was, was deemed not to be one of the centres. And uh, it's causing an awful lot of problems for people, particularly around Donegal, that they're having to, to travel very long distances down to Galway, and they may be very sick, they may be old. Um, no one has said that if they need to go in for major surgery, they have an issue travelling to Galway. It's the weekly or sometimes daily uh, trips for treatment, be it radiotherapy or chemo or, or what have you. And, and uh, there's a lot of people believe that actually setting up a treatment centre, not a, not a surgical centre, but a treatment centre in Sligo, uh, that not doing it in 20, 2006 actually was a mistake and that it's something that should be looked at and reversed. Are there any plans to look at that, analyse it, set something like that up? Yeah, I, I might just come in here and then uh, Jerome will, will uh, augment uh, and just very briefly just to mention screening in terms of early diagnosis, uh, we didn't cover that in its major part the uh, screening programmes which have come in under the previous programme which are advancing. Uh, in relation to the centralisation of uh, surgery in particular, um, uh, surgery under the previous strategy was centralised under eight designated cancer centres and that is looked on as one of the, it's, it's based on a population numbers of a half million roughly at the time per cancer centre. That would be looked on as one of the major successes yeah. of the previous uh, strategy in terms of outcomes. It's a proven fact that where you have a cancer surgery carried out by surgeons who have experience of doing a lot of surgery in a situation, in a, in a, in a, particularly in a, in a setting where there are others doing a lot of surgery, in other words, where it's centralised together, that the experience coming together and it works yeah. to the benefit yeah. of the patients we, we that's internationally that. accepted. Yeah. In relation to Sligo in particular, and Don, or Donegal, as you mentioned, I've had uh, 
numerous interactions with people from Donegal around cancer services because of that very fact and, and breast cancer being the, the major cancer in terms of numbers for surgery and treatment. Uh, we have a, a cancer surgery is carried out in Letterkenny uh, University I, Hospital. I, 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 I don't mean to come across as rude, please apologise, but just in the interest of time, would you be able, the, the specific question I'm asking is, is therapy being considered in Sligo? No, there isn't a change in the current structure being considered in Sligo, no. Okay, the radiotherapy or but, chemo or some of these... Well, we want to... I was coming to that. Do you want to talk about that again? Okay, thanks. Sorry, in addition to the North West Cancer Centre at Lagavulin, which is a huge step forward for the people of the North West, yeah. there, it is important to say that with eight designated cancer centres, there's, there's an actually large number of hospitals that aren't cancer centres that have chemotherapy day boards developing, de delivering care close to home. So that principle is already there and won't be changed. The other bit is we have to make sure we have to maximise the non-cancer centres' ability to deliver diagnostics and follow-ups so those patients don't have to travel for everything forever from diagnosis through to the end of the follow-up. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you? I know I think most or all of you sat through the previous session. Um, there were some pretty strong allegations in terms of the prioritisation given to uh, clinical trials and to research, uh, my sense is it concerned funding or funding cuts, um, but also very interestingly culture. And the allegation was made that whilst clinicians value research, that the system, so let's assume that some combination of HSE management and department officials and potentially politicians, the non-clinical elements um, don't value it uh, haven't funded it, haven't aligned incentives so that it's a smart thing for people to do for their career, haven't created the processes where space can be carved out for these clinical trials. Can I ask, would you accept the criticisms? Would you accept any of the criticisms and, and how would you respond to them? Uh, I'm just make an opening point, uh, comment in re related to the cancer strategy and then I'll, I'll refer to my colleagues in the HSC. Um, like, very briefly, in the, the three recommendations around research are to have a national cancer research group to uh, you know, move on coordinating, fostering uh, support to environment, research priorities, etc. Uh, the second one is to ensure the clinical cancer research and the staff who deliver it become fully integrated uh, as a component of cancer care uh, is, is coming to the point you're making. And then examining mechanisms to ensure that newly appointed uh, consultants have, have, have time allotted to this. And uh, the fact that it's in the strategy, we do, you know, we accept the basic point you're making, that uh, we, there's more to be done. And this would be a case like this is very much, as I said before, building on the previous strategy, and we would accept that research is an area that hasn't been developed as much as it could have been. And there's a commitment under this, and particularly through the Cancer Research Group, which will be set up in, in, the, in the first six months of this year, um, to doing that. Um, but there are a lot of uh, steps forward in cancer. Like cancer is one of the areas where research is, is, is somewhat more developed than in uh, than across the health sector, and it has. I think it has. Uh, the opportunity to use cancer as a, as a kind of a lead in, in making these improvements. And I just mentioned very briefly the Cancer Registry, which has, uh, has uh, tribute has been paid to it earlier. And uh, it has the data and the experience, and we're, and we're building on what they're doing at the moment to, to increase their can, capabilities. Can I ask on that, Mr. Conroy, Which just because, the, because uh, and thank, I, think, I think you've broadly accepted the criticisms. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you have broadly accepted them. Can I ask them, because I imagine what the clinicians and patients and, and, and the researchers very much want to know is given that it's in the strategy and given that there is a broad acceptance, I think, that, there, that it hasn't had the priority it had, when would clinicians, researchers, patients, when should they expect to see things being done differently on the ground? So first of all, I accept entirely your point, the points I made earlier this morning, it has to be prioritised. It wasn't possible to prioritise it 10 years ago, there were so many other higher priorities, but where we are now, it's absolutely essential we do it. It has to be criteria, and defining criteria for a cancer centre that has got a per research unit it's producing. It's patients get access and the staff are there to deliver the research. So in terms of when the patients can expect it, when the committee or the public can expect to see change, we've had a number of engagements over the last year and earlier since the publication of the strategy about how do we do it? We have had a number of engagements with Cancer Society, with HLB, SFI, and now we have a HC program, research and knowledge uh, 
program the HC, that's a huge step forward. So I'd expect before the end of this year we'll have a research group, terms of reference, memory, and a plan for the future. I would like yeah. to get that done before the estimates process and yeah. the service planning for next year. Thanks. And just on implementation, because one of the things that we've all become very used to, and I, I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but it, 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 it is a pattern probably in every government in the world that plans are brought forward and strategies are devised and signed off and steering groups are set up and there can be an unmerciful time delay from all of that administrative activity and things actually happening in hospitals, let's say. Have you a sense for when, I don't know how many cancer research clinicians we have, but it's probably a relatively small number of men and women. Have you a sense for when life is going to become materially easier for them in terms of pursuing research agendas around cancer trials and so forth? When are they going to feel a difference themselves? I mean, we're, we're not starting from year zero. We, cancer trials aren't hugely successful over two decades in producing a lot of research activity pro bono at weekends. That's the, the level. Yeah. The huge commitment from existing staff, both the medical staff and the nursing staff, the question is when can we get the core infrastructure in to actually add to their capacity to deliver research in the cancer centres mm -hmm. more broadly. So my ambition, my hope would be that in the service plan for 2020 we have a line that says development funding for the cancer control programme of which the Minister will direct that a certain amount is towards cancer research. That's my hope and ambition but there's also negotiation before that happens. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Deputy Donnelly. Deputy Kelly. Thank you. And uh, continuing on that team, we'd like to help you with that hope. <laughs> Um, I think this is our purpose of our committee, in fairness, we, we, um, I think we're all on the one page in relation to this, which is, uh, is good. Um, you know, based on, obviously, the evidence or the, what we were told uh, this morning, there's serious concern as regards, I mean, I don't doubt what you're saying as regards your wish and desire, but taking on from Deputy Donnelly, we've all been here before in relation to a whole range of other things. and. Many times they don't happen, or if they do, it takes a lot longer. We're behind here, so we need to catch up. So, I mean, so how many patients are on clinical trials over the last, as a percentage of patients, uh, uh, we'll say, let's go back to the last three years. What's the percentages for the last three years, on average, each year? The percentage when the cancer strategy was being drafted about 2017 was about, was 3% at that time. What is it now? It varies up and down. I don't know what it is in 2018. Will you come back and tell the committee? Yep. Will you come back? Let's just go 2016, 17, 18, and what, today, 19. Because what will inform the committee a lot, Chair, is a curve, the trend. Because really, it, despite not yourselves personally, but with all the will in the world, if they aren't going this way, then your proposals are going to be met with the same amount of enthusiasm. Because the fact is, is that this isn't from a, and my, the previous speaker Stephen took the words out of my mouth. This isn't a priority visually for for people who are, there I say, public service slash political life, policy wise, because it can't be seen. It can't actually be out there. And that's not good enough. It's just not good enough. We need to change that. And we need to change it fairly rapidly because we're so far behind. Um, I was very much taken by the uh, previous witnesses in relation to what they said as regards uh, future policy. And it was quite, it's quite obvious that there are two sides to this and I'd like you to address it. Firstly is obviously we need to increase funding. This, Mr. Conroy, is as much a question probably for you. Uh, how is funding going to be increased? What percentages are going to be, you know, are, are being looked at? And secondly, as regards what I would call for reason of need of term, uh, what, how are we going to ingrain the process? You say in your few words, uh, Mr. Coffey, you say that there is a requirement in relation to ensuring that we get permanent funding for research staff, all this, etc. That's agreed totally. But it's way bigger than that. It needs to be part of the whole process. It needs to be ingrained throughout the HSE. It needs to be part of the hospital network. And how are we going to ensure that that happens? And like yesterday, quickly. So my two questions are, firstly, I suppose, 
Mr. Conroy, you're probably better positioned to answer the question in relation to funding, and maybe Mr. Coffey in relation to how we're going to, through this new strategy, which I've no doubt that you're an advocate for, how we're going to ensure that process is ingrained. Well, I suppose it's, it's funding is always a challenge, and I, I've um, made the point that it's, it, this is in, in the strategy. We have a record in the previous strategy of implementation. We have a very open approach to this strategy in terms of what we've done so far, publicising it and so on. We have uh, a very open door in relation to dealing with all the uh, people, interest groups in, in, in cancer and so on. It's very on. unusual that they all stay behind for the second half, by the way. Well, I mean, I'd be surprised if they didn't, and uh, I'm joking, disappointed what? maybe. But uh, in terms of, uh, we have it is a very collaborative approach that we have used in in developing this strategy. The fact that that research is there, up in lights, uh, with commitments, with three recommendations out of 52, I think so, shows some commitment to it, and and other associated recommendations across the strategy around the cancer uh, registry and so on. Um, I can't give you a straight answer, like when we got approval to uh, the cancer, the, uh, cancer strategy from government in 2017, uh, around the funding would have had the term around, you know, that's funded in, in accordance with the estimates process each year and so on. Uh, we will continue to work with, we work very closely with the NCCP in terms of the details of, uh, and, and I have for the programme of, of the whole strategy, but uh, on an annual basis also with, with the NCCP on drawing up, we jointly draw up, I suppose, the estimate proposals, which ultimately, as I say, come into us. But, um, you know, uh, this is something that we are committed to achieving. So you have no idea, really, as regards funding percentages going forward? Well, I can't give you but like, a what's the thoughts of the, I'm not asking you to give us specifics, but mm. as regards prioritisation within the department, as regards where you're at as a department regarding this, I mean, are we going to see an increase? Uh, in, in relation to uh, research on the cancer side, I would, I would certainly hope so, but I can't give a commitment on that. In terms of the development of research more broadly across, uh, I don't know whether Anna or Jerome wants to comment on, on, on you know, there is, uh, I think it will be the, the, the actual appointment of a cancer research and director lead and so on, the HSC kind of shows that there is a change. And I accept that, that's not accept, good. Yeah. So, Same process. Yeah. First thing, funding, total funding, uh, 2018, we had 85.8 million to put into the system, it's up to 94.7, so the trend is up there now, we have to take a chunk of that and put that into research. So how do you, what the process to get research well, Let's see the month on the trials, we'll see. Yeah. So in terms of well. process, if there's a new post, a consultant post, that's funded and approved, it goes to the consultant appointments advisory committee, but it comes to me to sign off the job description of what it is. So just an example, uh, the current uh, principle is that we will increase the amount of research time on a consultant contract. A hospital came to me and said they had one session and said, no, actually the, stra the strategy says we need to increase, so at least double that. So I've pushed back, I will not approve a new post until there's a significant increase in the, in the research sessions on that contract. So that's a very pragmatic part of the process that we've already started. Okay, uh, I have three questions, Sharon. I know you want to manage time, it's been a long day. Um, final three questions. Um, What's the average time of reimbursement for oncology uh, drug versus the EU average? I do so because of evidence. I want to ask this question based on evidence given here by Sean Flanagan some weeks, months ago, probably at this stage. So what's the average time uh, for the reimbursement versus the EU average? Uh, because it seems to us that there's a kind of a process whereby we hold out to get the better deal, which, you know, that's one thing, but time is obviously of the essence here. Um, so that's that. The second question uh, that was inspired by comments made earlier by the CEO of the Irish Cancer Society. Um, can you give a commitment that from a capital funding point of view, based on the hundreds of hours of discussions we've had in here about the National uh, Children's Hospital and the knock-on effects, that no capital programme in relation to uh, the cancer side is going to be affected? That's my second question. And third question is something that's quite specific that I followed up for well over a year now is in relation to the National Cancer Registry Authority. And it's this, is that I was absolutely gobsmacked and alarmed in relation to what happened regarding the statistical and, uh, analysis and throughput and pathways um, regarding cervical cancer. I mean, it was I, through engagement with Minister Harris, that kind of we found out about this. We found out about almost by accident. 
can we be confident, this isn't a reflection, by the way, on the National Cancer Registry Authority at all. In fact, it's probably the other side. But can we be confident that the pathways for information flow, the necessity of you know, patient um, permission, the, the process by which those who uh, are diagnosed with cancer but come into the system from different pathways, all of that, that has all been looked at, dealt with, to ensure that we will not be going there again. There's a whole uh, Royal College Surgeons Review that's going on, which, by the way, is obviously meant to be done long ago and won't even be completed this year. Um, and it's a, as a result of the whole, uh, I suppose, the whole revelation about what went on there, and we still don't know, right? But just getting back to the statistics, my third question is, has all of that been dealt with? Can we guarantee that the HSE across all of these areas um, have lined up the statistical analysis or the statistical pathways with the National Council Registry Authority and there's no surprises again. There are my three questions. Yeah. Uh, first question there, time for drug reimbursement in Ireland versus the EU average, I'm afraid I don't have any data on that, I can come back to you with that, just not an area to the, to the committee. Uh, second thing, capital spent on, on infrastructure. Yeah, on oncology drugs. Yeah, oh, there. Sorry, sorry. On um, capital spend, it's important to say that there are a number of projects underway. Altogether, opened a couple of years ago. Cork, massive 50 million euro project handed over by the builders' equipment team. No. no delay. As Next long part. as the, the, it's not just projects not happening, it's also a thing, a, the famous phrase inside here from government profiling, which basically means like pushing it down the road. So none of that's going to happen in relation to any projects from the cancer side. I've heard no suggestion that'll happen. The next project, Galway. That's, that's Galway. not an answer, though, to be fair. I've heard no suggestion that isn't saying no, it's not going to happen. So who would be suggesting it? Surely you know. I'll be doing my best to make sure it doesn't happen. Okay. Um, radiation Galway enabling work underway. Construction start this year and a design team looking at the extension of the radiation centre in Beaumont. So that's all happening. No delays, no reprofiling on that. Um, the, second, the, the final point, uh, third question there, and the cancer registry, to remind people, I sit on board chair currently the Cancer Registry. There's been a massive amount of work in the second half of last year, continuing on to this year, uh, to implement as quickly as possible line recommendations from that SCARS report pertaining to registry. So, a data sharing agreement is in place, signed between the HC and the registry. There are a number of big issues that you mentioned, including having one source of truth, one source of data, or having one data repository. There are discussions on how best to do that, rather than having multiple sources, trying to link them, find them that they overlap and contradict each other. So that absolutely is a priority for the registry with the HSC. Yeah, uh, sorry, just a final thing on that, and thanks for that. But the last question in relation to National Cancer Registry is, it, for me, the issues were not at, at that end. The issues were, sorry, now at your end. And it was seriously alarming because they just, like, dare I say it, only for Vicky Phelan, like, we still wouldn't have done. But, like, how within the HSE and probably the Cancer Registry, but particularly within the HSE, there wasn't an awareness level of this, it was frightening. So, hopefully, now that's all been dealt with, and I'm sure it's the one standard across the board because the National Cancer Registry and all of that does good work and it's actually very good that we have it and it's absolutely necessary and everything the lads behind me do baseline on what stats they're doing so you know it just has to be prioritised. Thank you. Thank you Deputy Thanks. Kelly. Deputy Durkin. Thank you Chairman. Um, uh, first of all I, I thank our witnesses for being with us today and um, for the work that they have been uh, involved and engaged in. And just to take up one or two points from, from the previous session, clinical trials are not as, uh, is, is readily available in, uh, outside Dublin and Cork. What's the, what's the reason for that? Uh, what about Limerick, Waterford, Galway, uh, Letterkenny? Uh, surely there should be a, a spread across the country uh, in, in, in an even-handed way. That's one question. Uh, the other one is it's a straight question. Do you think the National Cancer Strategy is working? And this is important because I am of the opinion that the rudiments are in place to make it very successful 
and to work for, for, for very good outcomes and to improve the, 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 the life expectancy of cancer patients to a considerable extent. That's my uh, summation of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm like everybody else, everybody uh, lays questions on looking for confirmation. I spent a long number of years in the Public Accounts Committee, so I know how that works, Chairman. Uh, I, 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 I'm not asking, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I would ask a simple, not straightforward, honest answer. Uh, is it working? Is it worked to the extent, uh, best extent possible? And, and can you improve it? And uh, the other question then is in relation to funding. Every, every, every organisation requires more funding, that's a fact. The health services in particular are, are, are particularly in need of funding for a variety of reasons. Lack of action on time, uh, lack of intervention on time, lack of uh, um, adequate capital funding uh, on time, and as a result, a, a, a backlog. That's virtually the, the story of the health services. So I am not uh, suggesting, you know, that 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 uh, uh, we have an available uh, a, a bottomless pit in terms of funding, but. We do have to improve on that. Generally speaking, the health services here cost more than quite a number of other uh, European countries. So we need, we need to, to deal with that for the public consumption, from a public consumption point of view. And um, the, 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 the issue as to whether or not, um, for instance, somebody said to me some time ago that 10 years ago we, 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 had, we had a better system. We did, in terms of we had more money. But we'd borrowed the money. The country was broke. And nobody realised it at the time. And that's a fact, Mr Chairman. So at this stage, we now need to spend money carefully, wisely, and we need to make it available. I believe that's our, that's our duty. But we must keep in mind as well that we don't want to go back to where we were. Because I don't think the health system, any more than the rest of, of, of the infrastructure in this country, would be capable of withstanding another crash. And we have many challenging issues around us at the time, not the least of which is the need to make adequate provision throughout the health services. So a couple of questions there, Chairman, and I won't delay very long, but I might come back again. Mr. Conway, yes? yes, very much. I think the National Cancer Strategy is working. Uh, we've touched on some of the prevention measures. I suppose in the past people accepted the dangers of smoking. I don't think they were as conscious of some of the other dangers of cancer and didn't link some uh, lifestyle issues with cancer. And I think that's changing and we're bringing out a skin cancer prevention plan on the 1st of May in that regard. On screening, our numbers are up. Breast screening numbers last year were 76% uh, against a target of 70%, for example. On early diagnosis, uh, people are more aware of cancer, people are being more and more being encouraged to follow up on lumps or whatever. There's uh, a lot of work being done around the provision of diagnostic uh, equipment. We can do more, but uh, in, in our hospitals to, to uh, handle the, the numbers coming through. On the treatment, on the uh, cancer surgery, uh, improvements in outcomes are very marked by the centralisation of services and radiotherapy. Um, Jerome mentioned a new centre in Cork, which is, will have five lean-ex up from uh, four. The, the equipment for, for doing the radiotherapy work uh, is op will, will opening next year. Will open next year. Building will finish this year. It'll be commissioned in the first quarter of next year. Um, medical oncology facilities are being improved all the time and expanded. Bearing in mind that the number of people coming through is increasing. Um, in relation to involvement of patients, uh, it's very much interactive with patients in the implementation as it was in the drawing up of the strategy and patients are, I suppose, are our biggest critics in terms of ensuring that, that it is working and uh, uh, their views are, are spurring us on to ensure that it continues to work. I mentioned the kind of robust um, review uh, mechanisms we have in place with the NCCP with whom we work very closely and uh, it's basically a hand in glove approach across the department and the NCCP and the NCCP then are pushing the implementation all the time across the HSE. So um, we, we see figures coming through all the time. We try to use any money we get in a very judicious way to address any problems and so on. In terms of uh, funding generally, um, I think really it is, we we'll never have enough money, like we'll always be looking for like all areas of the health sector and all areas of government, we'll always like to have more, but I think what we do have we use very well. I think we're uh, using things in a very targeted and, and uh, 
outcome oriented way that that is followed up and that is recorded and that we see the outcomes from and that we we, we, we change money if you like change allocations in the details to uh, make sure that that continues to happen so if something isn't working as well we, we address that and so on so yes I am very like I think this is our third strategy uh, we're building on a very good strategy in the second one and uh, I think really we're into a depth of strategy here in cancer services. That is something that uh, um, you know will be followed and can be followed in, in other areas of the health sector. Sorry, Joe. Okay. I just make the briefs of points and thank Dr. Uh, Deputy Durkin for bringing up the economics, the macroeconomic picture. In preparing for this, in 2006, our national debt was 40 billion euros. Uh, end of last, well, actually this morning it was 217.9 billion. So that's an over, that's a background scary number, and um, that that will actually have to be considered as we invest in healthcare. Personally, I'm biased that we should, we should find the money, borrow whatever, invest, we want the better outcomes, but behind it, the government has obligations to manage that debt and, and bring it down over time. So that is the kind of the big issue behind um, a lot of constraints under which we operate. Thank you. Well, of course, um, Chairman, <laughs> just, uh, um, I'm not an economist now, but I spent a good lot of my lifetime in politics apologising to economists. Of course, the important thing about debt is uh, to, to uh, keep it at a certain level in relation to GDP or GNP or whatever you want to use, and uh, that has changed dramatically uh, and as a result of, of, of good management. And if, if, if steps hadn't been taken, which were taken at great cost to the health services and, and to right across the, 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 the board, uh, we would be in the same position still, but we could also find ourselves back in that situation again and, and very quickly. And don't forget that everybody told everybody that wanted to listen uh, 10 or 11 years ago that there was really no need to worry at all, that everything was going to be okay, everything was going to be grand. We could we'd see this out. It didn't happen that way. And so we need to be very, very cautious not to allow it to happen again. There's a question there that, that uh, came up earlier on as well. Access to, to cancer treatment. Uh, it's been suggested that people have been denied access to cancer treatment due to waiting lists, due to lack of uh, bed or other facilities. Uh, can you give me some idea as to the extent of, of that? Because that is an alarming issue. Uh, and has, has serious uh, consequences for the health of patients. Now, one other question out of that, Chairman. You'll be glad to know. Um, I, I might ask one myself before uh, well, you do that. We, uh, we, 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 we encourage that sort of thing, you know. Um, Dr. Coffey. Yeah, I'll just give you some very brief performance data. These are preliminary numbers from January of this year. Um, so, access storage and breast clinics, uh, the ten, there's a 10 day target that was, about the, the, that was reached in about 86.3% of cases, but actually, if you look to 15 days, so 96.9, 97% of women referred get seen within 15 days. So that's actually a big improvement on previous years and previous quarters. Lung cancer clinics, 85% get to its clinic within uh, 10 working days, 92% within 15, and 97% of referrals within 20 days. So that's actually good. It's not on target, but it's getting close to it. And for, uh, for rapid access to prostate clinics, it's about 85% of men are seen within 20 days and 95% within 30 days. And again, significant improvement over previous years. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's important, Chairman. Uh, I said I'll come back to, to you with another question afterwards. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. I uh, wait for the end. Um, in, in relation to uh, some issues that were raised this morning, in relation to prevention, um, particularly in relation to smoking and alcohol intake, the, the public alcohol bill is now on the statute books. Uh, in relation to minimum unit pricing and advertising and uh, display of alcohol in in uh, shops and supermarkets. So that's going to take some time to feed through I into the system, but it's very positive. But in, in relation to smoking, um, there are targets for 2025, and perhaps you might just comment on uh, we're not really hitting those targets. Uh, I know smoking um, is, the incidence of smoking is reducing, but it, we're, we're way behind, to the best of my knowledge, on reaching our target for 2025. So, so that's one issue. The second issue is in relation to screening and early, early detection. And unfortunately, with our cervical cancer program, only 80% of people will take up the option of having a free uh, cervical smear. You've referred to breast screening going up from 70 to 75%. How can we increase those figures? because it's a substantial gap in, in, this, in the cancer program, not being able to recruit 100% participation. 
And in relation to that then, the government had proposed to introduce HPV testing for, for cervical smears uh, in October of last year and it still hasn't come and the likelihood is, from what I've heard from the Minister, is it may not come this year. So perhaps you might comment on that. And also tied into that is the unfortunate backlog of cervical screening uh, now stretching back to over six months in some cases. Uh, how, how can that be addressed? And perhaps you might comment on how, how that is, is being worked through. And then finally, in relation to um, the treatment of cancer, oncology treatment and radiotherapy treatment, there is a, a patchiness across the country in relation to access. And I am aware in the Midwest that there is a problem in relation to getting access to radiotherapy uh, particularly radiotherapy, but also on oncology. So perhaps you might comment on those three points. I might just take the smoking one, maybe first. Um, the interim key performance indicator target in the cancer strategy uh, has been met in relation to percentage of adults those aged 15 plus who smoke. At the end of 2018, 17 per cent of this group smoke on a daily basis. That was the target. This represents a fall in the number of smokers from 19 per cent in 2026. So the aim is to get to a uh, five percent, which is which is uh, looked on as no smoking by 2025. But the, the target is set out in this strategy is uh, was met for for last year. Okay, but the, the target for 2025, as yeah. outlined, is not going to be met. For the, the eventual 2025. For the 5%. Um, well. It's an opinion, I suppose, but it's, it's going in the right direction, and uh, I think uh, a lot of strides have been made. And in European terms, I think we're apart from the UK, we're the top, maybe certainly we'll be the top EU country. <laughs> but but uh, um, performances like internationally, we were, we're, we're looked at as doing very well. Sorry, John. And just on that point, in, in relation to reducing t tobacco smoking. Does the department have an opinion in relation to the substitute of vaping in relation to reducing uh, the incidence of yeah, I'd have to come back to the yeah. I've asked that question myself actually as well. I, I think the um, general approach is that it's um, considered obviously to be better than smoking tobacco, but I'm not sure if we have a, a policy position at this point. Doctor. Chairman, on the other questions you asked there on uh, screening uptake, um, breast screening, cervical screening, those, those numbers are actually close to target. I mean, it's, I that's not identified as a real problem. Trying to convince people who don't want to have it to have a freely accessible service that may save their lives, that's a, a very challenging thing. But I think you, it's important to distinguish the, the colorectal screening. The target there is low and it's hard to reach that, but that's an international experience. For some reason, people are happier to go for mammograms, passengers are HPV testing, but have a fit, a fit test or FOB test and a scope, for some reason the uptake, it, despite best efforts and very impressive media campaigns in this country, it's a struggle to get up to the targets. I, I'm not sure internationally what the reason behind that is. Um, I'm afraid I'm not directly involved in HPV introduction of HPV testing, the date for that service, or how the, the, the backlog has been dealt with, but I can get that information sent back to you by the screening service. Uh, the final point of which is uh, the radiotherapy and access to cancer treatment services. I mentioned earlier about the investment in radiotherapy in Northwest, in Cork, in Galway, but starting that be a couple of years before their new centre is up, but it will be to meet future needs and will have state of the art technology. Uh, and in Dublin, there's been significant progress over the last decade. I think it's important to say that in the Midwest and the Southeast, we buy from the private sector, and those have been, those have been excellent <coughs> services that have been in place for a period of time. Those machines, both in Limerick and Waterford, are now at the end of a 10-year life cycle. So the question is, what's the best way to replace those and potentially increase capacity there as well so people don't have to wait? So there's work going on on that, and we'll probably have visible progress this year on, on decisions and on investment. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I just make a quick Conway. point on the National Cancer Screening Service efforts. They, they have very targeted efforts at uh, the most hard to reach groups to involve them in screening. And I would also like to acknowledge the help from the Irish Cancer Society in that regard. There's a lot of interaction between state and, and uh, the society and others. Um, because sometimes the people who you feel might need it the most are the people who are last to come forward. Thank you. And Deputy Dirk, yeah. final question? I, 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 some, several years ago, in fact, I mounted a campaign for increased lab facilities in this country. 
I'm not sure. In case that's me. It's not, actually. However, uh, <clears throat> uh, I am of the opinion that we need uh, enhanced laboratory facilities in this country, adequate to meet the present and growing population. I don't believe we have that at the present time. I believe that it should be a, a, an objective, an urgent objective, and I say so particularly in respect of, of uh, the cervical uh, uh, tests and the delays associated with them. And we know that the practices were wrong as well because there was a practice of not telling the patients what the story was, which is an appalling thing to happen in any sort of circumstances, and caused undue stress and 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 and. Uh, anxiety for the patients, and the patient surely should be the first person, the most important person in, 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 in the entire equation. So the laboratory facilities, also the, 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 uh, the cervical uh, the smear test system is in operation 10, 12 years or whatever it is, uh, more now. And um, at the time, some of us had doubts about it, but we were sold on it because it had the ability to save the lives of a considerable number of women, which it did. Uh, it had an only an accuracy rating of about 80 per cent or thereabouts, and, and still, and still uh, has no more. And my point there is this, if you add the, the, the um, accuracy rating uh, and the lack of information uh, that was, was prevalent apparently in the system, it made for a bad system in terms of confidence in it and the confidence of the patient in the system. Now the theory was that information was withheld from patients because it would undermine public confidence in the system. Well, which comes first? Uh, the, the need to deal with the patient and to assure the patient and to be absolutely certain that the laboratory to which the, 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 the tests were referred was, 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 was doing its job. And, and was, was accurate, and that there was a follow-up. So just, uh, if you might, just comment on that, because uh, the, the lab facilities and the, the methodology used in, 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 and the need for the alternative system, which is coming into vogue uh, soon. Dr. Coffey. Happy to take that as a starter. Um, I think the way to look at this is that uh, Dr. Sky's report, September of last year, put out very clearly recommendations which are in effect instructions which are being worked on at the moment. So that's all going to change in terms of HPV testing versus cytology and all the rest. I think the broader point on lab capacity is comes back to the rate of change of science. I worked in genetics lab for two years, so I went back there and I'll be fairly useless. Even in the middle of the last decade, things change. So I think what we need to be planning is a high-end diagnostic service in this country for cancer patients, whether it's screening or whether it's, di whether it's germline uh, genetics or tumor ge genetic sequencing, if you look at the UK, they've actually made that big investment decision a couple of years ago, and they're mainstreaming genomic medicine. We know what we want to do. We need to actually plan and invest in that fairly quickly. So I think that will encompass all areas of cancer, cancer diagnostics. Um, it is an exciting time. If you look at the researchers, there's a lot of activity in the universities here. We need to have equivalent or the same levels of activity in the clinical service we provide to patients in the hospitals. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, again, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Sorry for the delay in your session starting. Um, it's obviously a topic which is of immense interest and needs continual um, development and we'll certainly be coming back to it I think in the near f in, in the not too distant future so uh, just to thank you Dr Anna Therese Head of Research and Development at the HSE uh, Dr Jerome Coffey National Cancer Control Program of the HSE Mr Conroy uh, Principal Officer of the Cancer Policy Unit <coughs> in the Department of Health <coughs> excuse me and um, Judith Corcoran Assistant Principal Cancer Policy Unit Department of Health and finally, Ms. Therese Maguire, Head of Research. And sorry, uh, Kevin Byrne, Executive Officer of the Department of Health. Thank you. That concludes our meeting this morning. This uh, committee stands adjourned until the 27th of March. This is the 27th of March. Yeah. And a joint meeting on the 3rd, sorry. The on the 3rd of April. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Yeah. The, the committee on the 27th is a joint committee. Oh, sorry, is a select committee. Joint committee is on the 3rd of April. So the meeting is adjourned until the 3rd. Adjourned until the 3rd.
Thank you. Of April. Thank you. Thank you.